Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim's Anniversary Edition. My name is Camel, but more excitingly, however, welcome back to a long-awaited new episode of the Elder Scrolls Detective series. It is a series in which we investigate, curate, speculate, hypothesize, theorize, and quite often simply highlight and discuss interesting, mysterious, and hidden things that can be found within the Elder Scrolls games. Today, we are going to bravely delve deeper than anyone before into one of the most unsolvable mysteries within Skyrim. The concepts and questions are simple, but the grand expedition for explanations will send us spinning down a maddening rabbit hole. There are twists and turns betwixt gnarled pathways that seem to fork frantically into bewildering revelations and pungent puzzlement, truly putting this Elder Scrolls detective to the ultimate test. Now, if this kind of stuff does interest you, be sure to check out my other Elder Scrolls detective videos that I have already done. There's plenty of them and you can find them down in the description of the video via the Elder Scrolls detective playlist link. Now down there in the description, you can also find all of my social media links. Be sure to follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and Twitch. And if you would be so kind, please check out the merch store with over 100 items carefully designed for lovers of the Elder Scrolls series. Just like this Camel Elder Scrolls blanket, designed by yours truly. It keeps you warm and up to date with lore while you watch these videos. If you would like to help support the channel, that is a great way to do it and you get a cool item as well. But for now, let us clear our minds, gather our most potent potions of intellect, and prepare for an insane yet intriguing investigation. I am truly ever so curious to hear your thoughts on this persistently unsolvable mystery that has plagued the Elder Scrolls community and confused Skyrim players for over a decade now. So please be sure to stick around. I know it's a long video, but that's because there is so many pieces to this puzzle. It's taken four months to compile this video from start to finish. And with some of the things I've found, well, to put it simply, this investigation unravels into some of the strangest, most intertwined oddities of information that we have ever encountered in this series. And with some of the stuff we've looked at, that is saying something. So you are most certainly in for a treat. Sit back, relax, and get your opinions ready, as they are needed. To begin this journey, we'll make our way to the small township of Ivarstead, where initially we will need to take a look at two quests. These will give us the foundation for our investigation. Ivarstead was once known as Hilgrun's Steading. It's a small milling town found on the western edge of the autonomal hold, The Rift, wedged between Lake Gear and the base of the Throat of the World, the Snow Tower. Pilgrims and travelers often passed through this petite hamlet as they prepare their ascent of the 7,000 steps, which leads all the way up to High Hrothgar, home of the Greybeards. At first glance, there isn't much here in Ivarstead, and to be honest, even after many glances of the thatch-crowned village, there doesn't appear to be much here at all. There are a handful or two of townsfolk plodding on with their seemingly simple rural lives. Villamir Inn is the main haunt run by Wilhelm. It's a place where adventurers can roost for the night by the blazing hearth with drink and food in the plenty accompanied by serenades of Nordic tunes strummed out by Linley and her trusty lute. Across the way, there is a house where Klimek and Bassianus Axius live, who are both local fishermen. Down the road, we can find Fellstar Farm, where Fastrid lives reluctantly with her mother Boti and her father Jofthor. Across the street is a lumber mill owned and run by Temba Widearm, with the help of her assistant Gwilin, both of whom take bed at the local tavern we just spoke of, Villamir Inn. This diminutive, agrestic populace of Ivarstead call this quaint collection of structures their home. 
Oh, and yes, there is a Nordic barrow just behind the town, but we'll get to that much later on. For now, though, we are going to hop over the river and inspect this dilapidated cabin, isolated from the rest of the township, where we can meet the final inhabitant of Ivarstead, an eccentric Nord beggar named Narfi who, when we first encounter him, will bombard us with a disconjointed string of strange sentences. Oh, Raider, Raider, you live among the clouds now, dear Raider. I don't owe you money, do I? I miss Raider. She was so nice to Narfi. Narfi's sad he can't be with Raider. The mountain will eat you. Watch the mountain. If you see Raider, tell her that Narfi misses her and to come home soon. Very soon. Soon. Soon like the moon! Raider! Raider! I can't see you, Raider. I can't find you. Why are you hiding? Hiding? Hide, hide, hide. Don't make me sad. Clearly, Nafi isn't all there upstairs, as he is very sporadic and seemingly random with his nonsensical mutterings. He often speaks in third person and delivers unusual lines that don't appear to have any context or meaning. Or do they? For now, though, we'll press the matter and speak to him further, as to get a better idea of what exactly is going on with this poor, tortured soul. Here, have a gold piece. It's tax deductible. Oh, thank you. Divines bless your kind heart. Are you okay? Raid was here, then gone. Went to gather plants and never came home. Nope, nope. Everyone looked and no one could find her. Wilhelm said she'll be back. Told Narfi not to worry. Raider will come back. What's wrong with you? With father, I said goodbye. With mother, I said goodbye. Raider leaves and Narvi can't say goodbye. Makes Narvi very, very sad. Narvi needs Raider to say goodbye. Raider, Raider! Upon concluding this conversation, we will have the miscellaneous quest called The Straw That Broke. Okay, so what we know is that Narfi's sister, Raider, has gone missing after she went to gather some plants. It's not much to go off, really. But Narfi does mention that the innkeep Wilhelm told Narfi that Raider would come back and not to worry. Naturally, we should head over to Vilimir Inn and see what this Wilhelm character has to say about all of this. Wilhelm, what's the story with Narfi? Ah, uh, he's harmless. He's been in a state ever since his sister Raida disappeared over a year ago. He just keeps to himself in what's left of his folks' farmhouse across the river. Mm, but you told Nafi she'd come back. I just said that to make the poor guy feel better. I'm pretty sure she's dead. Raida would gather ingredients from the small island in the river east of here. Then one day, she just vanished. I tried to look for her, but she never turned up. Strange. Nafi mentions that everyone looked for Raider. Wilhelm himself says that he looked for her, but she never turned up. Yet, we are meant to find her just like that. Hm. Well, let's see if Wilhelm has anything to help us further. Tell me, is there anything dangerous on that small island to the east? I've seen some sort of a cave entrance over there. Folks call it Geierman's Hall, but I don't know why. Probably best if you avoid it for now. It didn't seem to do Raida any good. Well, okay. That's what we have to work with. Let's head out and look around, see if we can find any trace of this poor girl Raida. Luckily, we don't have to look hard at all, as there is a quest marker that leads straight to Raida. Well, what remains of her, and it's not far away at all. In fact, I find it alarming how close she is to the town of Ivarstead. She's literally next to the town entrance. Yet no one could find her? Strange. Well, this quest marker, of course, marks the remains of Raida. Her besotten and silt-washed skeleton lies on the shallow bed of Lake Gear. Within her soaked satchel, we can find a collection of rare alchemical ingredients along with her silver necklace. A sad end, but at least we can put this mystery to rest now, or so we think. If we take Raider's necklace back to Nafi, we can lie to him. Nafi, um, Raider said she'll be home soon. You've made Narfi so happy. Narfi now waits for his sister until she comes home. At least Narfi has Raider's necklace, reminds Narfi of his sister. Thank you for giving this to Narfi. 
Or we can tell him the truth. Nafi, I found Raider's necklace. Raider, You saw Raider? Did you tell her Narfi cries? Did you tell her Narfi never said goodbye like mother and father? Sorry, Narfi. She's dead. Oh no. No, no, no. Narfi never got to say goodbye. Now Narfi's all alone. At least Narfi has Raider's necklace. Reminds Narfi of his sister. Thank you for giving this to Narfi. Narfi's sad now. Still wait for Raida. No more sleep. No, no, no. Poor Narfi. He's quite actually mad. Couple of sandwiches short of a picnic, if you catch my meaning. His irregular delivery of subjects mixed with phrases that have no right being in the conversation. Talking in third person and his conveyance of off-kilter statements which have only been half-baked in the oven of reality. All of these traits sure do make him an odd case to try and decipher. We will go much deeper into the specifics of his semantics later on. But for now, that is the first half of the mystery. How did Raider die? And thus falls upon us the second part of the mystery. For this, we will need to be a member of the Dark Brotherhood. As one of the first miscellaneous contracts that we collect from Nazir holds the foundational pieces to this investigation that we're interested in acquiring. Astrid told me that you have some work for me. Did she now? Well, as it turns out, there are a few lingering contracts we haven't had the chance to complete just yet. And more, dribbling in from time to time. I'll assign them to you as they become available, to be completed at your leisure. Sounds simple enough. It is. These aren't particularly glamorous assassinations, I'll be honest. Don't pay much either. But they'll keep you busy. Just do them as you're able. There's no real time limit. The targets aren't going anywhere. You can turn each one in as it's completed, or wait and turn in the whole group when all the targets have been eliminated. Whichever works for you. I am ready for my first set of contracts. Well then, let's get started. I've got three available right now. Your targets are the beggar Narfi, an ex-miller named Enodius Papias, and Baytild, a mind boss. When you've completed all those, we'll see if I might have some more. Tell me more about Nafi. He's a hapless beggar living in some ruins just outside the village of Iverstead. Easy, even for you. Thank you. So, when we head to Iverstead on this contract and confront Nafi, we have the usual selection of psychotic, murderous dialogue options. Who are you? What do you want? We can remain silent. Do you want something? Look, if you ain't gonna talk, or spare no coin, just go away! We can tell him to beg. No. Oh, by the gods, please no! Or we can just tell him that we're here to kill him. Oh, oh no, please, please! I never harm no one. Oh, Narfi just wants to be left alone! Ah! No matter what we say, poor old Narfi runs away, and it's no wonder why. He flees for his life. Alone and fear-filled, he vermooses as sporadically as his speech is delivered. Shortly after, he ducks and cowers, shivering like a late autumn leaf caught in a gale. He will not fight back under any circumstances, despite being armed with a dagger. It is literally impossible to get Nafi to attack you. He's just a terrified, sad man who's lost everything. Now once the dark deed has been done and Nafi has been felled, on his body we will find the ragged clothes he wears. There will also be a bottle of alcohol and a lockpick, along with his iron dagger, which he actively does not use to defend himself. The rest is just random commoner loot. So now that the dirty work has been done, we might as well hand in the quest. Nafi is dead. Congratulations. You slaughtered an emaciated beggar in cold blood. You are truly an opponent to be feared. Here's your payment. For completing this assassination, we will be given 750 gold. This is actually an important aspect of this investigation because it is not a small sum of septums for someone to dish up in order to get a seemingly random and harmless beggar killed. Curious. So, 
What do we know? What do we have to work with? Over a year ago, Nafi's sister Rado went out to pick flowers or gather ingredients, and she never came back. And then, roughly a year later, at the time the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim takes place, someone had put a hit out on Nafi. So the two burning questions are why and why? Who wanted Nafi dead and why? And who or what killed Raider and why? As I said earlier, at face value, these very simple questions. But the answers get more and more complex the closer we get to them. And to further complicate Raider's death, there are two aspects surrounding her passing that change the rules a fair degree. Firstly, is a spanner in the works. Uh, two in fact, two spanners in the camel works. These spanners are actually iron arrows. It seems silly, but these two little buggers shake things up. How? Well, the very first time that we enter the exterior world cell that contains Ivarstead, two iron arrows will load in with the rest of the assets directly above Raider's corpse. Not many people know of this because they will bob off with the current of the water. And unless you happen to be looking right here at this exact spot when you arrive in Ivarstead, you'll likely miss them because they just float away. For educational purposes, I have turned in-game clipping off with console commands so that these two iron arrows don't float away and we can get a good look at them. I've also checked within the creation kit, and yes, these two arrows are here. A developer has put these here for a reason, but what is the reason? Well, given they aren't just in any random old spot, but instead specifically placed right here above Raider's body, means they're part of the story. Obviously, they haven't just been shot because Raider's been dead for a very long time and she's nothing more than bones. I do believe that these two iron arrows are supposed to be stuck in Raider's skeleton, but there is likely some kind of physics issue which prevents the arrows from being submerged, forcing them to spawn on the water's surface. I also originally thought that they may have been placed here on the water's surface to draw the player's attention to Raider's corpse, which could make sense, but there is no reason for that and actually a good reason for a developer not to do that. As when we get the quest, the straw that broke, the one that Nafi gives us to find his sister Raider, there is a quest marker on her skeleton. Therefore, subtle environmental hints like floating iron arrows is completely unnecessary. The player's perception is completely unneeded because of the quest marker. And another thing, if you discover her skeleton and pick up Raider's necklace before you start the quest, this will actually render the quest unfinishable in the future, as it messes up one of the quest stages, specifically the one in which you must find and pick up Raider's necklace. There's a quest stage for that action. Well, if you've already picked her necklace up before you have the quest, well, guess what? You can't pick it up again because you can't drop it because it's labeled as a quest item, and therefore you cannot complete this quest stage, making the whole quest unfinishable. So, drawing the player's attention to this location is not needed thanks to the quest marker, and it's actually very ill-advised, as if you do decide to come over and check out what's going on with the iron arrows, find her skeleton, grab the necklace, you'll never be able to finish the quest. So with all that in mind, again, I think these two iron arrows were meant to be underwater and stuck in radar but this was prevented by some kind of buoyancy issue in the physics engine. So, with these two iron arrows in the picture, and their apparent association with Raider and her death, we can surmise that she was likely killed by these arrows. Or, alternatively, killed some other way, but then these two iron arrows were used to pin her corpse to the lake bed like tent pegs, so her body wouldn't bob to the surface, something like that. Although, I find the former much more likely that she was killed with them. Anyway, there are two iron arrows in the picture. Okay, got it. And now the second piece of important information to keep in mind is the direction in which the water flows. 
If we jump into the Water of Lake Gear, where Raider's corpse is found, we will see that the current will actually take us east. It flows away from Ivarstedt. As at the southwestern corner of the town where the river bends below the mountain, for whatever reason, the current direction actually forks. To the west of the fork, it flows downhill towards the falls that lead into East March, and to the east, it flows towards the main body of water of Lake Gear. So, okay, thanks, Camel. That's great, but what does that actually mean? How does that affect this investigation? Well, here is an overhead shot of Ivarstedt and the surrounding area. Raider's corpse can be found right here next to the bridge marked by the red X. The divergence in the direction of the water flow occurs right here. To the west or left, the water flow turns north and cascades down the waterfalls past Nafi's house and the lumber mill and away from the town. And to the right side or the east side, the water flow goes under the bridge and continues to push east towards the island on the far right hand side of the shot. So, if Raider's body entered the water anywhere outside of the green area, it would have either floated down the waterfalls or it would have floated further east towards the island, away from Ivarstead. Remember when Wilhelm said this? I'm pretty sure she's dead. Raider would gather ingredients from the small island in the river east of here. Then one day, she just vanished. I've seen some sort of a cave entrance over there. Folks call it Geierman's Hall, but I don't know why. Probably best if you avoid it for now. It didn't seem to do Raider any good. Hmm, well, that explanation is simply not possible, as the island highlighted in yellow is down current from where Raider's skeleton is found. So if she was killed by something on the island, her body would have floated away from Ivarstead, not towards it. So whatever happened to Raider happened right here next to the town, somewhere within this green zone. It's the only possible and the only plausible area in which Raider could have met her end for her corpse to end up where it is. This small hydro detail massively narrows down the scope in which we can explain her death, or at the very least, the location of her death. Raider has to have been killed right here next to the town, or someone killed her elsewhere and then carried her body here, which I think is extremely unlikely. It is, of course, possible people have moved bodies before. To help you understand this, have you ever been at a party and your mate is passed out because they're too drunk and then you try to move them to a couch or a bed or something? It's basically impossible. People are really heavy. So imagine trying to silently move a corpse next to a town full of other people and patrolling guards. Yeah, I don't think so. Either way, it's very close to home and curious that no one noticed anything amiss, aka a body falling into the water or someone splashing around in the lake with a corpse in their hands. No one saw her die, no one noticed her corpse. I mean, it's been sitting there for over a year, right there in the shallows. Or if a body was dumped into the water elsewhere, again, it would have to be in that green zone, so it's still pretty close to where all this is happening, but you know, no one noticed the floating corpse. And given that the guards patrol the bridge she's found next to, I think it is more likely that Raider was in fact killed right here where we find her. So along with this new narrowing of scope and along with this new water flow knowledge, we also know that there are two iron arrows involved. So if Raider died by arrow right next to the town, who did it and why? And even if we figure that out, we then need to find out who wanted Nafi dead and why? A very perplexing and often conflicting group of questions to be sure. Let's start with some simple ones. I think that we can rule out it being an accident. For example, Raider slipped on the mossy shoreline and cracked her head on a rock and landed on some arrows or something like that. Perhaps she took her own life. I guess it's technically possible that she drove two arrows into her heart to end it all. It's very dramatic, but possible. But then we don't have Nafi's assassination explained. And it's also overall a pretty weak theory, but let's not rule anything out while we go through the list of potential candidates. Now, what about animals? The rift is full of creatures that could very well kill someone. 
in this case, Raider. There are bears, spiders, wolves, and trolls, along with probably other creatures that I'm forgetting, that scurry and roam about the woods that surround Ivarstead. Now, even the local miller, Temba Whitearm, has a problem with the local bears. These damn bears are driving me crazy. Those damn things will drive me right out of business. Have you ever seen what a bear does to the trees? They jump on their hind legs and scratch them to bits, marking their territory or something. It's getting to the point where I have to scour Skyrim for untouched trees at the right size. Cost me too much time and money. But this complaint is about the bears scratching the trees and ruining the lumber for her mill, rather than it being an issue with the bears attacking people. However, there is a troll that lives in a small cave just to the north of Ivarstead down the hill. Surrounding the troll are dead Stormcloak soldiers. On one of their corpses, we can find a note that reads, Captain, there have been multiple complaints about attacks near the river northwest of the Rift. We could use some more civilian support from that area for the war effort, so send a few men to investigate. It's probably just a couple of wolves, so you'll only need to send at most two men. Happy hunting! Hmm, so with that note, we can confirm that there have been creatures attacking in the area, and this troll had no problem with taking out two Stormcloak soldiers. So a troll battering Raider, the little flower girl, would have been easier than a puzzle in a Nordic tomb. But yes, while it is of course possible, this troll, wolves, or a bear, or something of the forest creature category could have killed Raider, there just aren't enough pricks of evidence to call it a porcupine. Said creature would have had to have killed Raider right next to the town without anyone noticing the howls, roars, screams, or any of the general commotion that so commonly accompanies a person being ripped to shreds by a vicious beast. Raider's skeleton is also found whole. As we can see in the local bear caves, beasts of the forest aren't so neat with their victims' remains. On top of this, the Iron Arrows have no explanation, and of course, who called the hit for Na'vi's assassination? A bear? No. So was it an animal? I'm going to say no. But I will preface this point and the rest of the video by saying anything's possible. But of course we do, just as we should, want evidence. We need evidence to back stuff up. So it could technically be just about any of the theories we're going to talk about. That is why I'm so keen to hear what you think happened. But of course, the more evidence we have and the more that the glove fits, the better. So for now, I will say no to the creature theory. I do not think an animal killed Raider. Ah, now speaking of woodland creatures in the local area, I was thinking that it may have been a simple hunting accident, as there are plenty of deer and elk that bound frolicsome through the burnt orange wilderness that is the hold of the rift. And to make use of these beasts are, of course, hunters. So what if some hunters were tracking an elk through the thick bosks, knocked their iron arrows, drew their strings back, let loose, but missed their mark. And instead of hitting the elk or whatever it was, they took down poor Raider by accident as she crossed the river with a basket full of alchemy ingredients. Well, it would explain the iron arrows, which hunters do use in Skyrim. So the iron arrows actually fit here. And if a hunter were to accidentally shoot someone down, well, I'm not saying it's right, but it is totally plausible that they would just leg it back into the forest and run away. Opposed to, of course, turning themselves into the guards after having accidentally murdered a woman. So Hunter accidentally kills her, Hunter runs away, that's why it's still a mystery. And then, if we want to explain Nafi's assassination, the Hunter slash Hunters in question wanted to shut him up about his missing sister Raider. So they called for a Dark Brotherhood assassination on him so that Nafi's eternal hunt for his sister wouldn't lead to their accident being uncovered. Sounds kind of hot, but I do have some major issues with this theory and the things I just said, we definitely filled in some gaps there. So don't forget that there are two Iron Arrows. This means that the Hunters or Hunter would have had to have missed the Elk, hit Raider by accident, and then fired a second arrow straight into Raider once more. 
a second arrow for a mercy kill? Maybe. This would also have to all take place without anyone in the town noticing. Again, we find Raider's body literally next to the town. And along with this, there are also no hunter's camps anywhere near Ivarstead. The nearest one is all the way over on the other side of the rift. So hunters don't actually hunt in the surrounding area of this mystery. There is a band of treasure hunters close to Ivarstead, but the clues in the name, they are treasure hunters, not game hunters. And these treasure hunters also do not wield bows and therefore do not use iron arrows. And if Raider was killed by treasure hunters, why is her bag full of treasure? Doesn't make sense. Oh, and finally, a hunter coughing up 750 gold pieces for Nafi's assassination. Well, that's quite a lot. It's also one year after Raider's death. So even if someone did find her corpse now, i.e. us, there isn't anything specific pointing the hunters out as the perpetrators. I mean, just look how hard we're working right now, just to try and find an explanation to this all. So was it a hunting accident? Again, it's plausible. We've got the iron arrows and a potential reason for Nafi's assassination. But overall, this theory is really not tickling my fancy. It's got like a 5% on the moist meter. Now, who else uses iron arrows around here? Well, not a single person in the town of Ivarstead owns a bow or has iron arrows or arrows of any kind. Apart from the guards, but they use steel arrows. And as far as we can tell, the guards had no reason to kill Raider. And if the guards did kill Raider, it wouldn't be a mystery, would it? The townsfolk would know exactly what happened to her, which they don't and the guards use the wrong type of arrows, so it just doesn't add up at all. Also, what, the guards are calling a hit on Nafi? I don't think so. But you know who does use iron arrows? Bandits. Oh yes, the classic old bandit up to no good as usual. There are plenty of nearby bandit hubs in the surrounding locality of Ivarstead, and they do use iron arrows. Bandits are also known for killing innocent civilians from time to time, but bandits tend to murder people to steal all of their valuables. And once again, like the treasure hunters, on Raider's corpse, we can find her satchel, which is full of uncommon and rare alchemy ingredients, which are worth a pretty penny, along with her silver necklace. So if a bandit did take her out, why does she still have all of her easily plunderable loot? Hmm, yeah, it just doesn't add up. And of course, let's not forget who called the hit on Nafi. Gah, it's all falling apart. I think we better just abandoned this theory. Bears, hunters, bandits, they are all well and good, but it's a bit drab, don't you think? Why don't we move on to something a bit more grandiose and dark, like vampires? Yes, that's right, vampires. Or in this case, a particular vampire. Might sound silly at face value, but there is a very strong theory that a vampire killed Raider with some bloody good evidence, but it also has one fatal flaw. So, roughly in the center of the rift, there is a small rotten shambles of a shack that goes by the name of Redwater Den. It's a skooma den where addicts can get their fill, although the Khajiiti elegance and allure of the substance is most certainly lost here. To make the plot even darker, however, there is a cave system deeper into Redwater Den which is crawling with vampires, who cook up Redwater Skooma. They then feed this to the Skooma addicts, who get super high and pass out, and then the vampires come in and drink their blood while they're tripping out. It is grim as all hell, but it's symbiotic at the same time. The Skooma addicts get what they want, and the vampires get what they want. Ideal by no means, but I guess it works. Anyway, deeper into Redwater Den, we can also find the Redwater Spring, which is what led the leader of this den here, a vampire called Venaris Vulpin. In the depths of this ancient Nordic ruin, we can actually find one of Venaris Vulpin's journals sitting right next to a brazier on a tabletop. Within it are some very interesting things. Let's have a read. 28th of Sun's Dusk, 4th Era, Year 200. I've found an interesting book of short stories on the pawn shop's shelves today. 
I don't think the owner will mind if I take it. I really should spend more time around the docks. These Ultima are too thin-blooded for my taste. Anyway, one of the tales in this book is an account of the Bloodspring of Langir's Feast, a fabled source of power for vampires. It's a story I've read several renditions of before, but this version suggests that it may be located in Skyrim, in a ruin buried by quaking of the earth during the Second Era. Considering that my business here with Inquisitor Alomare is, shall we say, at an end, it might be a good time to leave Somerset for a worthwhile diversion for the next 20 or 30 years. Perhaps I shall investigate this fabled bloodspring. Second of Morningstar, 4th era, year 201. I was able to obtain passage from Alinor to Solitude by way of ship. No mean feat with this Nord insurrection going on, I assure you. I ran across one of my own in the local tavern and feared at first that it might cause problems for me. But it turns out that she is well positioned here in the city and has been happy to help if I keep a civil manner. A quick pause here really quickly, if you are curious, the vampire in Solitude that he speaks of is Sibyl Stentor, who I believe is the true puppet master of Skyrim's political system. You can check the video above that I've already done on it if you are interested in finding out more about that. But for now, let's get back to the diary. <clears throat> we spoke much on my research into the Bloodspring, and while she made sure to point out that she thinks it's a soft-headed pursuit, she did say that what she's heard would point to Riften. Fifth of First Seed, Fourth Era, Year 201. After months of searching, I finally may have found a lead. While looking for a bit of dinner in the Villamir Inn, I overheard an old hermit by the name of Jokal talking about strange red water he found bubbling out of the ground. Yes, once I dispose of this soldier, I'll follow to see if I can find this location. Now, the diary does go on further about the blood spring, and that's all very well and good and interesting. But for this video, we have read what we need to. So this vampire, Venaris Vulpin, was in Villamir Inn, the very inn in Ivarstead that is run by Wilhelm. Venaris Vulpin also admits to killing someone there. He refers to this person as Dinner. So immediately we're thinking this is our dude, right? Well, while many believe this to be the glove that fits, or in this case, the fangs that fit, there are two major flaws with this theory. Firstly, written right at the end there, it says, and I quote, while looking for a bit of dinner in the Villamir Inn, I overheard an old hermit by the name of Joe Cull talking about strange red water he found bubbling out of the ground. Once I dispose of this soldier, I'll follow to see if I can find the location. Venaris Vulpin says he killed a soldier. As far as we know, Raider was not a soldier. All we do know about her is that she went to pick flowers and gather ingredients on the island nearby the township of Ivarstead, and that she then vanished and somehow died. So we actually have no reason at all to believe that this soldier, Venaris Vulpin disposed of, was in fact Raider. But the true flaw with this theory is timeline. You see, Wilhelm tells us that Raider disappeared over a year ago. He's been in a state ever since his sister Raida disappeared over a year ago. This is important because when you start a new character in Skyrim, the game always starts on the same date, the same in-game date. And that is the 17th of Last Seed, year 201 in the 4th era. We'll use this chart to make it easier to visualize this. So, Last Seed is the 8th month in the year, which consists of 12 months just like real life, they just have different names. So, if the earliest possible date that we can get this line from Wilhelm is the very same day that we start the game, which is this 17th of Last Seed, year 201 of the 4th era. That means that Raider, at the very least, had to have gone missing on the 17th of the Last Seed, year 200 of the 4th era. Given he says that she went missing over a year ago, it was likely even further back than that. But with this in mind, when we look at Venaris Vulpin's journal entry for when he was at Villamir Inn in Ivarstead and killed the soldier, we can see that it is dated with the 5th of First Seed in the 4th era year 201. So this is actually five months before the game starts. 
which would be at minimum seven months after Raider went missing. So this person that the vampire killed could not have been Raider. And of course, Venaris Vulpin being involved doesn't explain the Iron Arrows, nor does it explain the Dark Brotherhood hit on Narthi. So as cool as this bloodthirsty thread would have been, sadly the calendar just drove a stake through the heart of this vampiric theory. But while we're on the path of weird plots, how about this one? What if Raider faked her own death? Sounds a bit weird. Why would she do that? Well, hear me out. Raider was a young woman trapped within this tiny little town, living with her brother Narfi in the ruined remains of their parents' farmhouse. Perhaps Raider wanted to get the hell out of Ivarstead, which is not an uncommon feeling amongst the townsfolk of the village. As the only other young woman in the town is Fastred, who, much to the disgruntlement of her parents, really wants to leave Ivarstead and explore the big wide world. Oh, you're a traveler. You must have so much to tell about the world outside this boring town. I can't imagine how exciting it must be to journey from place to place. You're so lucky. I wish I could go with you. <sighs> but Fastrid feels trapped by the sense of duty of the farm, which is being bared down upon her by her mother Boti and her father Joththor. Along with this, Temba Wyatarm, the mill worker, along with Bassianus Axius, are not too fond of Ivarstead either, despite it being their hometown. Well, with this in mind, what if Raider had the same feelings? Not wanting to be trapped in this declining town, not wanting to live with her strange brother in the shattered remains of their deceased parents' homestead, but instead escape and see the world with no strings attached. Well, one way to do this would be to fake your own death. She could have very easily gathered up some bones from Shroud Half Barrow, the Nordic tomb just next to the town of Ivarstead. Within the vestibule, the entryway, even now, there are plenty of skeletons and bones ready to be scooped up. Raider could have collected all the parts she needed, placed them in the river, along with her satchel and necklace for someone like us to find, and then conclude that she is in fact dead. I mean, it works, as here we are trying to find out how she died. So if she did do this, well, this ploy of faking her own death is most certainly an effective and convincing one. And to build upon this, another thing that has always rubbed me wrong is the fact that Raider's necklace is found within her satchel. Generally, if you leave the house with your necklace, it is around your neck, not in your satchel. Well, if Raider faked her own death, this would actually explain why her necklace can be found within the satchel. It was a clue left behind to, once again, give the conclusion that yes, these remains do in fact belong to Raider because, hey, here is her necklace. When in reality, if you wish to believe it, this was just a clever ruse, in so that Raider could smoke bomb from her former life living in Ivarstead with absolutely no strings attached. She could have placed the iron arrows with the bones she gathered from Shroud Half Barrow again as an indicator of how she supposedly dies. And if we really want to get grim, we could speculate that she called the hit on her brother Narfi as a mercy kill, seeing his descent into madness worsened by her vanishing. Although I would find it more likely that if Raider was aware that Narfi had gone downhill, so to speak, she would just come back and be like, hey, I'm back, everything's okay, oh my god, rather than being like, hmm, let me kill him. But regardless of which color you wish to paint it, the overall theory does make sense. But that's not actually as far as it goes. In fact, this is just the beginning. So let's just say that Raider did fake her own death. Where did she go? Well, we know that she used to spend her days collecting flowers, plants, and ingredients and such from the nearby wilderness. And what does one do with alchemy ingredients in Skyrim? That's right, they make potions, or cast spells, or perform rituals, or something of the sort. So... Was Raider an alchemist, or some kind of magic doer, or both perhaps? While it is possible, and I do actually think 100% exactly what's going on here, at this point it might seem a bit baseless. But get this. Raider's brother Narfi, he's a beggar. He has just about nothing to his name. His house has some scraps of food, a little bit of drink, 
a couple of homewares, he sleeps on the floor, he carries nothing of value, his home is in ruin, he wears ragged robes, he is totally skint. But when we finish the quest to find Raider, as a reward, Nafi will give us three alchemical ingredients. But these aren't just any old ingredients, as the alchemy ingredients that Nafi gives us are from a pool of rare alchemy ingredients which consist of Briar Heart, Daedra Heart, Death Bell, Fire Salts, Frost Salts, Giant's Toe, Hag Raven Claw, Hag Raven Feathers, Ice Wraith Teeth, Imp Stool, Jazz Bay Grapes, Nightshade, Nern Root, Vampire Dust, and Void Salts. Now, these aren't just random ingredients. They are not common ingredients, nor are they uncommon ingredients. But specifically, all of the rare ingredients in the game. Isn't that strange? Hmm. Now, for those unaware, each alchemy ingredient within Skyrim is tagged as either common, uncommon, or rare. These rarities determine the probabilities of them spawning in alchemy shops or vendors' inventories or as random loot in satchels and such. Now, there is also a fourth category of ingredients which are tagged as no rarity. Now, ingredients that are tagged as no rarity, well, this tag prevents them from spawning as loot or in shopkeepers' wares and stuff like that. This is important because along with the pool of rare alchemy ingredients listed less than a minute ago, Nafi also has a chance to give you a human heart and or human flesh. These are the two ingredients that are tagged as no rarity. This is actually really important because they don't appear in loot pools. So that means that a developer has intentionally added these profane alchemy ingredients to Nafi's already suspicious pool of rare alchemy ingredients. Which brings up an even more grand point. Nafi here, essentially a homeless beggar, skint and poor, has nothing to his name. For whatever reason, has access to all of the rarest alchemy ingredients in the game. Most of which are very expensive or very hard to come by. Along with him having access to human flesh and human hearts. Two alchemy ingredients that are so rare and vile that they have been tagged as having no rarities that they don't appear in places where they shouldn't, like in a shopkeeper's wares, or as a quest reward. Yet, they have been specifically and intentionally added to Nafi's quest loot pool by a developer. I mean, Nafi could have given us anything. He could have given us some common alchemy ingredients, like mountain flowers. He could have given us a book. Maybe he could have given us a family heirloom, a unique item. Maybe he could have become a follower. There are a million options. But no, Nafi, a beggar with no money and nothing to his name, just magically has access to a collection of alchemy ingredients so rare that it would make a Telvanni wizard's tower hard. So, how? Why? Well, I believe that these ingredients that Nafi has to offer as a quest reward actually belonged to his sister Raider, as I have an ever-mounting suspicion that Raider was more than just a simple lass who liked to pick flowers. Imagine, if you will, that Raider was actually, at the very least, an alchemist, and given the exquisite selection of ingredients that Nafi has to offer us as a quest reward, Raider may have been something well beyond a mere alchemist. It might sound a bit wacky, but hold tight, my friend, there is some, well, there's some weird stuff cooking. So firstly, these rare, expensive, and in some cases illegal alchemy ingredients that Nafi specifically has access to have no explanation as to his acquisition of them. The only person with the slightest inkling of an alchemist and or of someone who would have possession of any alchemy ingredients within Ivarstead was Raider who, as far as the townsfolk were concerned, she traveled off into the wilderness to harvest ingredients. However, when we find Raider's supposed skeleton, we also find her satchel. Now, excluding her unique necklace, Raider's satchel actually has the same loot table as an alchemist's satchel. While the loot is randomized, it's not just a collection of simple local mountain flowers, it contains any range of valuable, rare, obscure, and hard-to-come-by alchemy ingredients. Therefore, 
we can surmise that Raider was not just an average farm girl who liked to pick petals, but instead she was at the very least well versed in the understandings of alchemy. Or she was someone who had reason and purpose in collecting these rare ingredients. Such as a witch, or a sorceress, or a druidess, or something of that occult ilk. With this concept in mind, if Raider was such an apt alchemist or magic user, then where did she practice these arts? The people of Ivarstead appear to have been unaware of it, for the most part, but we'll get back to that later on when we talk about Wilhelm. But no one mentions that Raider was cooking up potions, no one mentions that she was casting spells, no one mentions that she was, you know, doing alchemy and using rare ingredients in the town, all they know is she went into the wilderness to collect ingredients. And within her and Nafi's family home, there is no alchemy table, nor any sign of Kabbalistic arts having been performed. And with that said, forget just Nafi's house. The whole town of Ivarstead has literally nothing to do with magic. No enchanting tables, no alchemy tables. There's no wizards or warlocks or alchemists or healers. Nothing. So I'll ask again, where then? Where did Raider do her thing? It just doesn't make any sense. Or does it? You see, there is something very curious tucked away within the rift. A small shack. One you yourself may have run across. This is a location known as the Alchemist's Shack. Now before we take a look around, I think that it is very important to note that this is the only unoccupied Alchemist Shack within the entire game of Skyrim. And where is this shack located you ask? Well, given the scope of the entire map of Skyrim, this abandoned Alchemist's Shack just so happens to only be a stone's throw away from Ivarstead. Not only is it in the same hold, the rift, but its proximity to Ivarstead is, well, quite frankly, suspiciously convenient, let's say. Raider, the only character in Skyrim that I can think of that is known to be a fairly prolific alchemist or magic user given Nafi's quest rewards and Raider's very own satchel and she was known for collecting ingredients, you don't do that for nothing, well, she has no evidence of anywhere in which she would have performed or practiced alchemy. Yet, the again only abandoned alchemist shack in the entire game, provincially speaking, is right next to Raider's hometown. Hmm, that's handy, isn't it? So let's just take the not so great leap and imagine that Raider in fact escaped the boring mundanities of Ivarstead and used this very alchemist's shack as a workshop. And while it's not rock solid, I mean, the glove does fit pretty damn well. So what's going on here at this shack? Well, firstly, and most importantly, there is actually an alchemist's table, which we know Raider didn't have access to in Ivarstead, which makes this one right here the closest alchemist's table to Ivarstead, which in turn makes it the most likely one that she would have used. Inside the shack, on the bedside drawers, we can find an alchemist's journal. Let's take a read, shall we? Coming to this area was a brilliant decision. The local flora seems to have many useful properties that I've been able to utilize into new potions. Outside, the rich soil has allowed the cuttings I've collected to grow into fine and bountiful plants. This afternoon, I think I will journey out for more mushrooms as my current supply is beginning to dwindle. On a personal note, I have moved my alchemy work outside the shack. I find the midday air as a boon to my health, as well as inspirational to my work. Now this alchemist's journal could have been written by Raider. It also could not have been, which is just fine for our investigation as whether this recluse alchemist that wrote this journal was Raider or not, it doesn't really matter, as Raider still could have used this location as her workshop. I mean, the two of them could have shared it, or maybe Raider found it second, or maybe the alchemist that wrote this journal found this abandoned alchemist's shack 
after Raider had already died. And because there are no dates within the journal, we have no idea of when it was written. Could have been written yesterday, it could have been written 50 years ago, who knows. Now there is also a note on the table that I'm sure you spotted, but we'll pay no mind to it as it was added with the Creation Club content, so whether it should be considered canon or not is questionable, and it also just gives us a quest to get a pet rabbit. So regardless of whether it is canon or not, it serves no actual purpose in our hunt for the truth when it comes to Raider and Nafi, so we'll just move straight past the note. Anyway, along with the note and the journal, there is also an apothecary satchel on the table which will contain common ingredients. Which is interesting, as this may have been Raider's, or it may have belonged to an alchemist before her or after her. Regardless, whoever set up this shack was serious enough about alchemy and their art to build slash set up this place. So they're a pretty serious alchemist, right? But then their satchel contains just common ingredients, which is just fine, but Raider's satchel contains rare and uncommon ingredients. Point being that Raider has got better, rarer, and more powerful ingredients than someone who loved alchemy so much they set up a whole cabin dedicated to it. Which just even further proves that Raider was a pretty serious collector of ingredients, whether that be for alchemy or magic, or both. Now if Raider did come and use this place as her alchemy workshop, well, that's great, but what does that mean? Well, she could have been using this place. Sure, it's reasonable. It's got all of the stuff that she did not have access to while living in Ivarstead. Namely, the alchemist's table, along with the garden of alchemy ingredients, while also being very close to her hometown. So again, it's totally plausible and I reckon likely. Also, remember that list of exclusively rare and illegal ingredients that Nafi just happened to have at hand to give us as a quest reward, and those that Raider had in her satchel? Well, with this alchemist's shack in the fray, we can start to understand where she might have acquired a fair few of them. As right next to Raider and Nafi's house in Ivarstead, we can find Nernroot. There is also Nernroot right next to the island Raider supposedly frequented to collect ingredients. On this same island, we can find Impstool. And at the Alchemist's Shack, we can find Frost Salts, Fire Salts, more Impstool in the buckets, and outside we can find growing in the garden, Jazz Bay Grapes, Nightshade, and Death Bell. So suddenly we've got seven of the 15 rare ingredients between Ivarstead, the island, and this alchemist's shack. And while sure it's not a particularly potent tincture, little details like this build up over time into a bigger picture. So, Raider could have cooked up potions and honed her skills here and then simply been killed in one of the many ways we have discussed and have yet to discuss. Or she could have faked her own death to escape her life in Ivarstead and set up here. But it raises the question, if she did fake her death to escape, surely she'd be here, right? In her wilderness alchemy shack. So if she's not here, then where did Raider go? Well. Let's for a second think about a lone woman living in a remote area who is highly talented in what some would consider an occult art, whether her super rare ingredients be for alchemy or magic. We can rightfully assume that she didn't have these ingredients for no reason, so she was either an alchemist or some kind of magic user. Well, this magic lone woman living in the middle of nowhere in a remote town, she then fakes her own death to escape the mundanities or perhaps even the oppressive aspects of the fringe farm town of Ivarstead. Where would she go? Where would she feel welcome? Who would welcome someone of this description? Well, personally, I think this sounds like a pretty good candidate for some witchy activity. As we know, there are plenty of women, young and old, within Skyrim who align themselves with a witch's coven. There are also some witches and even hag ravens within the rift. But what is even more curious is that just over the hill to the west of the alchemist's shack, just as we enter Falkreath, there is a location known as Orphan Rock populated by witches, all female of course, and a hag raven who is of course also female. It's hard to tell, I know, but trust me. Now this location would be the perfect place for Raider to escape Ivarstead and join her magically inclined sistren. 
as much like the alchemist's shack, this location, Orphan Rock, well, it's conveniently near Ivarstead. In fact, the alchemist's shack is basically smack bang in the middle of Ivarstead and Orphan Rock. If you follow the road, of course. Along with this, here at Orphan Rock, we can find more nightshade growing, and on the table, we have more death bell, along with two more rare ingredients, Hagraven feathers and a Hagraven claw. This potentially explains how Raider and therefore Nafi had access to these very rare and very hard to come by ingredients. So Raider may have been coming here during her life, or she may have faked her death and then escaped here. Who knows? But things are about to get a lot fishier, literally. As on the rocks just next to the Hagraven, we can find a whole lot of blood splattered on the ground along with two fish, one river betty and one silver side perch, both of which are alchemy ingredients. But more importantly, they're out of place. What do I mean by that? Well, good question, but here is a better one. How did these two specific types of fish get here? Might seem like a bit of a silly question, but I assure you it's not. Well, what if Raider brought these fish here as a gift? Perhaps an offering to the almighty Hagraven? Sounds a bit far-fetched, I know, but get this. Here at Orphan Rock, there are no locations nearby in which Riverbetty or Silverside Perch spawn. So these fish had to come some way to end up here. Now the three nearest locations to Orphan Rock, where we can find not just one of them, but in all three of these spots, both the Silverside Perch and the River Betty spawn together in all three of these locations. And well, 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 guess where the three nearest spots to Orphan Rock are, where we can find not only either, but both River Betty and Silverside Perch. Well, it's right here in this little stream. This little stream that is quite literally next to Nafi and Raider's house. The next closest spot is right here next to Ivarstead where the water current diverges. And the third closest spot is here in Lake Gear right next to the island in which Raider frequently visited to collect ingredients. Ah, hmm, very interesting. I'll say it again, the three most nearby locations from Orphan Rock where we can find both of these fish are all at the exact spots that Raider spent her entire life, the island she visited to collect ingredients, her hometown of Ivarstead, and literally next to her front door. So to base things purely on proximity, it makes sense that this is where these fish would have come from. And all right, let's think, do we know anyone who spent their time at all three of these locations? but was also known to collect ingredients, hmm. And also someone who had potential reasons to visit Orphan Rock and the Witches and make an offering to the Hagraven. Hmm, yeah we do. Her name's Raider. Now of course, this theory, along with all the others, could not be true at all. But if we did want to run with it, we could surmise that Raider either did or didn't use the Alchemy Shack, she may have been the one to set it up, maybe she's the one who found it after another alchemist had set it up, or maybe she didn't use it at all. Regardless of this, Raider still could have very well come to convene with the Hag Ravens and Witches of Orphan Rock to make them an offering, which would raise the alarming eyebrow of why are these fish covered in huge amounts of blood? Is it from the fish? It's an awful lot of blood for some tiny little fish. Or did whoever brought these fish here as an offering get absolutely destroyed by the Hagraven? Perhaps that is how Raider died and met her end. I mean, it's possible, but I personally think the most likely string of events in regards to this whole theory is that Raider used the abandoned alchemist's shack. I also find it relatively easy to believe that she convened with the witches and Hagraven of Orphan Rock, but I do truly believe that the skeleton we find in the water next to Ivarstead is in fact Raider's body. And I think that someone in the township of Ivarstead learned of Raider's witchy escapades and put an end to her. And I think you will too, once we get onto Wilhelm. But as pretext to such drastic maneuvers, let's get some other popular theories talked about before we start pointing fingers at the innkeeper.
Let's start with some easy ones and cover the theories that seem to always pop up among the Elder Scrolls community when discussing the ever grand and unsolved mystery of Raider and Nafi. After all, this is aimed at equipping you with as much information as possible. And honestly, who knows what's true? There are definitely some theories that have way more evidence and way more like psychological reasoning behind them, but nothing's concrete. So it's important to talk about everything so that we, together, can discuss what really happened here. Firstly, a fan favorite, a plot twist. Nafi did it. Nafi is, as we have established, clearly a madman. He speaks in third person and says strange things that don't quite make sense. He also appears to be somewhat of a drunkard. I'll live to drink another day. His speech is kind of slurred and altered somewhat in the same way that being intoxicated would affect one's speech. We can find ale on his body, we can find some bottles of alcoholic beverages around the house, and see him gulping from his tankard. A perpetually drunk man who's got a few screws loose, killing his sister in some kind of intentional or even perhaps accidental fit of violence is possible. The idea being that uh, the mental trauma of performing sororicide, uh, that being killing one's sister, such an abhorrent, twisted deed of physical and psychological brutality made Nafi crack. It broke him. Just as an automatic survival response, his mental state was filled with barriers that prevent him from actually remembering what he did. That's why he lulls about, yelling out Raider's name. He's waiting for her. He doesn't remember what he did. He loves her. It's his sister. He was the only person who was ever nice to him. Yet, somehow, for some reason, he killed her, and his mental state crumbled. As Wilhelm states, He's been in a state ever since his sister Raida disappeared over a year ago. Nafi has been in a state since his sister disappeared. So while he could have been a complete nutter before she disappeared, he also could not have been. He could have been a normal dude that's just undergone so much trauma and stress from the disappearance of his sister that he's kind of devolved into this muttering fool. Regardless, Raider's disappearance has put him, and I quote, into a state, a state of muddled insanity. But if we do want to run with this Nafi theory, we can say that he kills Raider for whatever reason, but then he doesn't remember. The damage is done, he has subconsciously blocked it out, and his brain carries the scars and walls to prevent him from knowing his own dark deed. Don't forget, the quest is called The Straw That Broke. That straw is Nafi's mind. And this video is the straw that broke this camel's back. Anyway, Nafi also says this, which, by the way, he says before we've even met him, let alone before he knows that his sister is dead. Oh, Raider, Raider, you live among the clouds now, dear Raider. You live among the clouds now, dear Raider? You live among the clouds now. That sure sounds like Nafi knows that Raider is dead. Normally when referencing someone, the phrase in the clouds means they aren't thinking straight. They're off with the pixies, they're frolicking with the fairies, they're daydreaming, they're not quite in the present. However, in this case, Nafi says that Raider lives in the clouds now, which sure seems to imply that she is in some kind of afterlife. I mean, even just beyond the real-life sentiment of heaven being in the clouds, we can look at Sovereignguard, the Nordic afterlife here in Skyrim, and it's up in the stars, in the clouds. Well, it's actually quite literally in the stars, as Sovereignguard is in Aetherius, the light from which shines through holes in the firmament, and that is what we see as stars on Mundus within the Elder Scrolls games. But we will actually talk more on that much later on for a totally different reason. Anyway, point being that yes, in the Elder Scrolls, much like here on planet Earth, we look up to the stars, we see the sky, the clouds, heaven's up there. In the case of the Elder Scrolls, heaven is literally up there, beyond the stars. And that's important because it means that when Nafi says, you live among the clouds now, dear Raider, that contextually, yes, it makes total sense that he is saying that she's dead. Which again is very odd because he says this before we've even met him. Which is, of course, before we tell him that she is dead. So he shouldn't know that she's dead, yet somehow seems to? Or is he just a madman saying mad things? I don't know. But it's suspicious. Well, it actually might be explained by the mad god, Sheogorath. 
which sounds so silly and so cheap, I know. Ooh, a crazy man. Must be the doings of Shio Gorath, but I assure you, there is some very weird stuff going on here in Ivarstead. And don't forget, I've been making this video for four months and it led to Shio Gorath. But sit tight though, as we will get to that unholy gnarled chain of discussion much later on. Anyway, apart from this single line about Raider living in the clouds now, I really don't see any discernible motive or reason or evidence as to why Nafi would want to kill his sister. Nafi also does not own any arrows or a bow, so the whole iron arrows thing doesn't add up with Nafi in the mix. It's also proven in both word and action that Nafi is actually harmless. Nafi says this about himself. Oh, oh no, please, please. I never harm no one. And Wilhelm says this about Nafi. Ah, uh, he's harmless. So the consensus around town is that Nafi is in fact harmless, and to set this claim in stone, when we go to assassinate Nafi for the Dark Brotherhood mission, as we are literally killing him, he just cowers in fear. And do not forget that Nafi is armed with a dagger, but he never draws it. He does not protect himself from death, he does not fight back, even when we are trying to kill him. So again, Nafi is proven to be harmless in both word and action making it, of course, even less likely that Nafi was the one to kill his sister Raida. Now, Nafi also references saying goodbye to his mother and his father, but he never got the chance to say goodbye to Raida. Raida! You saw Raida? Did you tell her Narfi cries? Did you tell her Narfi never said goodbye like mother and father? This clearly implies to me that Nafi was not there when Raida died. Some have taken this line as meaning that Nafi did kill his parents, you know, goodbye mother and father, boink, 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 stab stab, and is therefore a psychopath, and therefore he also killed his sister. But I see no reason to believe he killed his parents, purely on narrative, motive, and evidence, and even if Nafi did kill his parents, he said goodbye to them. So if he didn't get to say goodbye to Raider, well that just confirms that he didn't kill Raider, because if he did kill her then he would have had the chance to say goodbye. So personally, I don't subscribe to this particular thread of evidence, but uh, you should subscribe to this channel. And while we are on the topic of Nafi's parents, let's talk about their old farmhouse. I often see in discussions within the Elder Scrolls community that Nafi's family house was burnt down. There is a bunch of theories that stem from this, but we are not going to go into these because, well, I don't follow this one either, but you should follow me on Twitter and Instagram. As there is no sign of a fire, all the wood and thatch is broken, it's crumbling, it's unmaintained. Yes, the house is a pile of garbage, but there's no ash. There's no cinder, there's no char marks, there's no black burnt wood. So we actually have no reason at all to believe that Nafi's family home burnt down. My best guess is that Nafi's house was pummeled by an avalanche or rock slide or something of the sort, stuff falling off the mountain, likely killing his parents in the process. If we look at where Nafi's house is situated, it's right at the base of a very steep cliff that leads up and up and up to the blizzard battered throat of the world. And next to what remains of Nafi's house, there is also a perfect ravine for rocks and snow to slide down and be funneled precisely on top of his home. Now, given there are no giant rocks inside Nafi's house and the wooden floor is intact, I would put my money on a snow slide over a rock slide. Snow slide, the weight of the snow can make the roof cave in and stuff, but if big boulders were coming down, like, the house would be gone. To confirm this idea, within the Elder Scrolls Online, this same area, at the base of the 7,000 steps, right next to where Nafi's abode is, the path to High Hrothgar is actually closed off due to a massive avalanche that swept down the mountainside, rent trees from their roots and swept boulders away in the process and completely buried the 7,000 steps in snow and ice and debris. So not only could an avalanche happen in theory, 
but we know for a fact that they not only occur, but occur at the very spot that Nafi's house is below. And again, the geographical layout and position of Nafi's home make it the perfect bullseye for an avalanche coming down the mountain on this side. Now, remember when Nafi says this? The mountain will eat you. Watch the mountain. At first, it seems weird and to have no meaning, but when we pair this line of dialogue with the idea that Nafi and Raider lost their parents and their home to an avalanche cascading down the mountainside, suddenly that line of dialogue makes a hell of a lot of sense. It's also worth noting that Nafi can be found mining this stone at the base of the mountain next to his hovel. Given the state of the homestead, we can deduce that Nafi clearly is not using the quarried stone to rebuild his house, nor is he selling the stone as he's broke. So is this act of mining some kind of strange catharsis? Like a ritual of revenge for Nafi. He's causing damage to the mountain, the mountain that ate his family, as Nafi so literarily puts it. Although, to be fair, he could also be saying the mountain will eat you because over the years he has watched pilgrims go up the 7,000 steps and never return. But the fact that he also says to watch the mountain, the mountain will eat you, that seems to me much more inclined to be a warning about avalanches rather than a warning about he saw some pilgrims take a hike. So I believe that Nafi's parents were killed in a natural disaster and his family home was destroyed in the process. This does make the most sense given the aforementioned evidence. Now, all of what I just said could also not be true, but to be honest, there is literally no evidence to formulate any other theory to do with the death of Nafi's parents or how his family home got destroyed. Therefore, it's the only theory we have, so it's the one I'm running with. So whether you believe it or not, this theory that Nafi was in fact the one that killed his sister Raider then leads to the idea that someone in the township saw him do it, said witness uh, then contacted the Dark Brotherhood to get rid of this now mad murderer Nafi. But if you saw Nafi kill his sister Raider, surely you just tell the guards immediately. Why wait a whole year to then dish out 750 gold and pay for his assassination when it could have been sorted out for free straight away by the guards? Mm, just doesn't add up. So overall, I am personally not at all sold on the concept that Nafi is Raider's murderer. In fact, I am certain he is innocent of the crime. And there is one last theory in regards to Nafi being the one who killed his sister Raider. It is a theory that I've seen online a few times and one I personally don't buy, but the theory is that Nafi is a werewolf. That's why he lives alone on the other side of town. He lives in tattered clothes, just like werewolves do, and his house is a mess, which could potentially be the result of a werewolf just going, you know, nuts in a house and smashing the walls down. So the idea is that Nafi turned into a werewolf, he slaughtered his sister, and when he came to, he had no memory of it. As cool as that plot twist would be, I'm a sucker for evidence, as everyone should be. And when it comes to evidence, this werewolf theory seems to be entirely based off of this single line of dialogue. If you see Rada, tell her that Narfi misses her and to come home soon. Very soon. Soon. Soon like the moon! I will admit that I have no good explanation for it other than Narfi's just a nutty guy saying nutty things. And for all of our sakes, I did check in the creation kit and I can confirm that Narfi is in fact not a furry. I mean a werewolf. He's just a plain old human. And don't you think that someone in town would have noticed a werewolf running around Narfi's house every full moon or noticed a werewolf running through town and murdering someone? And also werewolves don't murder people with arrows. So the iron arrows go unexplained as well. So not only is there no evidence for this theory, but there is also several things that make it impossible. Anyway, in conclusion, we don't actually have any solid in-game reason to believe that Nafi killed his sister Raider, apart from this one throwaway line. Oh Raider, Raider, you live among the clouds now, dear Raider. And I will be the first to admit, it's a suspicious piece of dialogue to be sure. How the hell does he know that his sister's dead? 
But as suspicious as it is, that one piece of dialogue cannot hold back the tide of reasons as to why Nafi appears to be completely innocent of his sister's murder. And as I think I mentioned earlier, the fact that Nafi knows about Raider's death before we tell him that she's dead, there is actually an explanation for this, but you'll have to hold tight for that one as it is very deep in a very weird rabbit hole that we're going to get to later on. But while we are talking about the mad lad Nafi, let's take a look at the standalone reasons as to why someone would want him killed. The potential reasons. Leaving the death of his sister Raider to the side for now. So when we first encounter Nafi, he will say this. I don't owe you money, do I? Now, of course, he is a beggar that lives in squalor, so taking donations from the good-willed public is to be expected. But Nafi uses the term debt. Interesting. This is an important distinction. As an example, let's just say that you are walking down the street and you see a homeless person sitting there asking for money. Out of the goodwill and charity of your own heart, you decide to give them $10. A week goes by, you're walking down the same street, you see that homeless person again, they don't give you the money back, nor is that expected. It was a donation, not a repayable fund. So while Nafi is a beggar and accepts generous donations from other people, the fact that Nafi even brings up debt means that he is in debt to someone, if not many people. Now, when someone owes you money and they don't pay you back, that is really damn annoying. It's also rude and extremely disrespectful. But would it be enough to push someone so far as to call for his assassination? That is pretty extreme. It's possible, but extreme, even within a fantasy universe like the Elder Scrolls. The major flaw here is that if Nafi did owe someone money, why would that person pay even more money to have him killed? One, you're obviously losing even more gold, but if you kill the guy that owes you money, that's a surefire way to never get back the money that they owed you in the first place. So dishing out 750 extra septums to 100% guarantee that you will never see your money ever again? Uh, no. Yeah, nah, that just does not make any sense to me at all. Now, what if Nafi was a burglar? As when we kill Nafi, we can see in his inventory that he actually carries a lockpick. I did check in the creation kit and he'll always carry this on him. So Nafi, for some reason, has a lockpick. Well, what do you use lockpicks for? That's right, picking locks. Now in the town of Ivarstead, the only locks to be picked are the front doors of people's houses. Given Nafi's bankruptcy and near state of homelessness, it's entirely within the realm of reason to formulate a theory that Nafi has been sneaking around town and trying to break into people's houses, possibly for riches, but honestly, probably just to keep himself fed. Don't forget, Nazir says this. Congratulations. You slaughtered an emaciated beggar in cold blood. You are truly an opponent to be feared. Here's your payment. He uses the word emaciated, of course, meaning abnormally thin or weak, especially due to illness or a lack of food. So poor old Nafi having to skulk around and try to steal food from the other townsfolk just to feed himself, it is a likely explanation for the lockpick that is always found in his inventory. With this in mind, tampering with people's homes and private possessions is a sure way to drum up grudges with the local folk. So Nafi may have been caught or even just spotted during the act and gained the unending fury of one of Ivarstead's residents. It might seem extreme, but imagine if you kept seeing your neighbor trying to break into your home. You'd be pretty fumed, right? And I mean, hey, even in real life, depending on which country you live in, you could be within your legal rights to kill someone that you see trying to break into your home. That's how much such an activity pisses people off. So now we take that emotion and add it into a fantasy world in which paying for an assassination is more every day than it is in real life, I hope. Well, this could be the reason that someone wanted Nafi killed. It's totally within the bounds of possibility. 
And speaking of this, who owns the only two homes in Ivarstead with locked doors? That would be Klemek, the fisherman and Uber Eats delivery boy for the Greybeards, and Jofthor, who owns Fellstar Farm, both of which have some suspicious qualities specifically when it comes to Narfi. Firstly, Klimek. He seems like a pretty normal bloke, but weirdly, for most of the day, he just stands on the opposite side of the river from Narfi's house and stares for like eight hours every day. Pretty weird, right? Why is he staring at Narfi? Well, Klimek is supposed to be a fisherman. That's what he's labeled as. That's his job in town. He fishes. But when Skyrim released in 2011, there was no fishing animation in the game. So is this idle blank staring into the abyss next to the river, death gazing over at Narfi, is this meant to be Klimek fishing? Him just standing near water? I think it is meant to be that, but also the devs could have at least put a fishing rod or some fish on the shoreline to imply that this is a fishing spot, a stool, anything. Because there are other locations all throughout Skyrim that have been here since launch, since 2011, since the base game, where an NPC is a fisherman or fisherwoman, and to tell that story, the developers put stuff around them, like a rack of fish or again a fishing rod, whatever it is. It's environmental storytelling that lets us know they be fishing. So the devs could have definitely done a better job of letting us know that yes, Klimek is in fact fishing when he stands here. Because what we actually ended up with in-game is just really creepy. He stands still for eight hours, eyeing a madman across the river. Anyway, that's Klimek's death-staring theory. There is no other evidence he has ill will towards Narfi, and no evidence that he had an attraction to Raider either. So apart from the weird death-staring, which we can explain as a lack of animation slash lack of developer storytelling, we don't have anything to point towards why Klimek would actively be standing here for eight hours every day giving Narfi the evil eye. But let's now talk about Jofthor. This is a little more esoteric, but very, very odd and interesting. Everything Jofthor does and says is nothing too interesting, although he does seem to be extremely protective of his daughter Fastrid. She wants to go and see the world and Jofthor is pulling the classic overprotective dad moves to make sure she stays safe, aka never leaves the farm. Now, no one in the entire game of Skyrim mentions Raider, except for Narfi and Wilhelm. And no one in the entire game mentions Narfi, except for Nazir and Wilhelm. Which makes this next discovery very strange indeed. When you interact with Jofthor, the game runs a unique script when you speak to him. It checks whether his daughter Fastrid is dead. If she is dead, then this will be the scripting gateway for Jofthor to respond with a line of dialogue like, Oh, my poor daughter Fastrid's gone, I miss her, blah 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 blah, something like that. This makes sense, total sense. There's plenty of characters that have scripts like this. However, this script that runs when you say hello to Jofthor not only checks if Fastrid is dead, but it also checks if Narfi is dead. Now this script doesn't actually do anything, it doesn't change Jofthor's responses or open new dialogue. And because of this, this piece of script was flagged as a bug and removed with the unofficial patch. What is interesting is that in this section of bug fixes for the unofficial patch, every other response is flagged as no longer appropriate. These no longer appropriate responses are things like you do a quest where you run into someone and they say, oh my god, one day I hope I get my very own sword. And then you do the quest and you get them a sword. You run into them again and they say, oh my god, I hope that one day I get my very own sword. It's like, no, 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 I did the quest, you do have your own sword. Things like that are dialogue responses or checks that are no longer appropriate. But this line of script that Jofthor has to check if Narfi is dead is the only one in this entire list that is flagged as unnecessary conditions, making it unique in the fact that it's not actually a bug. It is unnecessary, but it's not a bug. It just doesn't serve a purpose in the version of Skyrim that was released. This, to me, implies that there were bigger plans for the Narfi story, obviously involving Thastrid and Jofthor, potentially. I mean, this piece of script, it didn't write itself. A developer added this, 
and for a reason that appears to have never fully formed. Sadly, I don't think we can take anything away from this other than there were once bigger plans for Nafi's story that never made it into the final version of the game. Cut and unfinished content in Skyrim? <laughs> Unheard of. I would love to hear what you think these bigger plans could have been. A love situation, perhaps? I guess we'll never truly know what Bethesda had planned for Nafi. Unless one of Skyrim's developers who knows about this is watching this. Hello. I would like to talk to you, please. So as far as standalone reasons for someone wanting Nafi killed, we have the two more plausible options, which is he owed someone money and that he was caught trying to break into someone's house, both of which just lead to they had a grudge against him and wanted him gone. And along with these, we have the two weirder occurrences, the first of which is Klimek staring at Nafi for eight hours every day. And the other one is the aforementioned legacy code that makes Jofthor check if his daughter Fastrid is dead, along with checking if Nafi is dead. I would love to hear if you have any other reasons that you can conjure up as to why someone would want to assassinate Nafi. But after months of digging and literally four months of working on this video, these are the only reasons I can conjure based on in-game evidence. And even then, these theories are lukewarm compared to the red hot theories coming up. So, with Nafi out of the way, no pun intended, but it's welcome, let's take a look at Wilhelm. And if you think any of the stuff we've talked about so far is weird, you haven't seen anything yet. As trust me, this Elder Scrolls detective found some very wacky stuff. So, as we know, Wilhelm is the chap who runs the tavern here in Ivarstead, the Villamir Inn. Along with this, besides Nazir of the Dark Brotherhood, Wilhelm is the only NPC in the game that mentions Nafi. And besides Nafi, Wilhelm is the only NPC in the game that mentions Raider. So clearly he's got an ear for gossip and the goings-ons of the town. But because he's the prime source of information, this also makes him the hottest potato to take a good look at. While we attempt to unravel what the hell is actually going on around here. So let's just run through Wilhelm's dialogue again, as so we don't miss a beat here, and also so we can poke holes in everything he says. Wilhelm, what's the story with Nafi? Ah, uh, he's harmless. He's been in a state ever since his sister Raida disappeared over a year ago. He just keeps to himself in what's left of his folks' farmhouse across the river. Hmm, but you told Nafi she'd come back. I just said that to make the poor guy feel better. I'm pretty sure she's dead. Raider would gather ingredients from the small island in the river east of here. Then one day, she just vanished. I tried to look for her, but she never turned up. Tell me, is there anything dangerous on that small island to the east? I've seen some sort of a cave entrance over there. Folks call it Geierman's Hall, but I don't know why. Probably best if you avoid it for now. It didn't seem to do Raider any good. So Wilhelm told Nafi that his sister Raider was coming back just as a tool of comfort. And you know what? Sure, that is a fair reason to say such a thing. But this comfort he gives to Nafi could also stem from two places of guilt. Either Wilhelm feels guilty that he was involved in Raider's end, and he feels bad because his actions have led to the mental down spiral of Nafi. As he says, Nafi has been in a state ever since Raider disappeared. He then follows this up by saying that he's pretty sure she's dead. Which, again, I mean, sure, that's a reasonable conclusion when a girl has vanished for over a year. But it could also mean that he knows she's dead. He also mentions the island where Raider would go and gather ingredients, which we'll take a look at in a minute, don't you worry. But Wilhelm says that he tried to look for her, but she never turned up. And he could have done. He might be genuine. But this could also be a deflection from his guilt. In an attempt to appear as the only one who tried to help out, subtly painting himself in our subconscious as a good guy. He's the good guy in this situation. Oh, Wilhelm, he's a good guy. He tried to help and look for Raider. Oh, Wilhelm, he's the good guy. He says Nafi's harmless. Now again, Wilhelm could be totally genuine, or Wilhelm could be pulling some 200 IQ moves to trick us without us even noticing. 
On top of this, if Wilhelm did try and look for Rada, he sure as hell didn't do a very good job. Her corpse is literally right next to the town, in shallow water. Her skeleton is found like 15 meters from the front door of the Villamere Inn. So instantly, this laughable proximity is suspicious, and it makes the fact that Wilhelm looked for her even more suspicious. How did he not find her? Or did he find her but lies to us? Or did he actively not find her? Or is he lying and did not look at all? Or did he look, didn't find her, and he's being totally honest? I'm not sure, but I will say that my spidey senses of something's up are definitely tingling. Wilhelm then mentions again the island where Raider gathered ingredients, a place called Geerman's Hall. Wilhelm then tells us to avoid it, as it didn't seem to do Raider any good, insinuating that something on the island killed her. Again, this could be an honest opinion of Wilhelm's, or it could be a tactical deflection from what he actually knows happened to Raider. Anyway, let's put this island thing to bed once and for all. So what is on this island? What is Geerman's Hall? Well, as we know, the island has some decent ingredients on it. That's why Raider used to come here in the first place. But just as Wilhelm does say, there is a cave here. As soon as we enter it, we will be greeted by a fairly well-sized cavern. There is a dead adventurer who appears to have been killed by the group of skeevers here. Next to them is a giant hole in the floor that leads down deep into Nurn where we will find the Nordic tomb of Geerman's Hall. And yes, while it is filled with Draugr, the Nordic undead of old, one, they have no way of actually getting out to where Raider would have been, and two, they don't use iron arrows. The Draugr use ancient Nord arrows. And despite all of this, as we established towards the beginning of the video, by the laws of hydrophysics, Raider could not have been killed on the island. If she had been, her body would have floated east away from Ivar's dead. Raider has to have entered the water or have been killed within this green section that we spoke of earlier. It's the only possible way that her corpse could have ended up where it did. So, Wilhelm's explanation of something on this island having killed Raider is simply just plain impossible, and therefore, whether it be intentional or accidental, it's just incorrect. Now, before we delve into the depths of what Wilhelm has to offer, I'd like to quickly brush over some very common theories that people have about Wilhelm in regards to Raider slash Narfi along with a theory of my own, but admittedly, it's rather decaf. It's not my strongest brew. But as I keep saying, I don't want to leave anything unexplored here. This video is for you, and so we can have a discussion about this. So I don't want to leave anything unsaid. So firstly, for whatever reason, within the Elder Scrolls community, I often see discussed the notion that Wilhelm was in love with Raider, and he either killed her out of some kind of jealousy or wanted Narfi dead because he thinks that Narfi hurt her, something along those lines. Such a theory is just fine, but I've never seen any actual evidence to suggest that this is what happened, nor was I able to find any in the four months that I spent working on this video. So the conclusion of that is, of course, I don't think that this theory is true and there's no reason to believe it is. There is also another thread of thought that Wilhelm called the hit on Narfi as a mercy kill to put him out of his misery, essentially. Again, they are both plausible within the rules of the universe, but none of them have any like tangible in-game evidence to suggest they even exist. Although, with that said, Wilhelm may have called to have Narfi assassinated. But the reason for that... Well, we'll get to that much later, as there's much more to uncover for that to make any sense at this point. But secondly is my theory, which isn't great, but it's worth mentioning, as maybe you can work it into the grand picture somehow. So, as we know, Wilhelm runs the Villamere Inn, and he says himself that he struggles to get business as Ivarstead is a small fringe township, especially now with the dragons and the civil war. You know, those two things don't exactly encourage folk to travel around the outskirts of civilization, i.e. pass through Ivarstead. But what if there were two inns in Ivarstead? Well, Wilhelm might have had motivation to put this other in out of business. Maybe it's possible. 
What am I talking about? Good question. So within the Elder Scrolls Online, which is set roughly a thousand years before the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim takes place, we can visit the Rift. And we can even make a visit to the town of Ivarstead. Well, the very same building that is Vilamir Inn in Skyrim is actually known as the Hawker's Tusk Tavern here in ESO 1000 years prior. But do you know what else is here? A building. A building in the exact same spot as Narfi's house is in Skyrim. Now, this structure here in ESO is much bigger. It's much grander than the squalor we find in Skyrim. But this isn't just any old house. Oh no, this is actually a second inn slash tavern called the Pilgrim's Rest Inn. Now, I will say I can find no connection between any of the people living in Ivarstead in ESO and those who live in Ivarstead in Skyrim. The only correlations are that where Vilamir Inn is, there's a tavern, and where Narfi's house is, there's an inn. Well, with these two inns in mind, what if Narfi's parents ran the second inn in Ivarstead, and Wilhelm saw this as competition to his business, so he sought to destroy their tavern to save his own inn. How did he do this? I don't know, caused an avalanche? Killed Raider? Has now called a hit on Nafi, is trying to get rid of the whole family to ensure that his inn never has in-town competition. Well, it is possible, but much like some of the other theories we spoke of earlier, there's no actual evidence for any of this. But I did want to tell you it because I thought it was an interesting enough piece of information that just appears to not fit anywhere. So again, maybe you're smart enough to work it in somewhere and make it fit the bigger picture. So now, with uh, some of the mundanities out of the way, let's properly dig into Wilhelm. So sometimes, when we wander into Vilamir Inn, we can overhear Wilhelm talking to his bard, Linley Starsong. I think I saw it again. That ghost. It was over by the Barrows. That thing's evil, Linley. I told you to keep away from there. I'm sorry. I was curious. I didn't believe the stories. I won't go over there ever again. See that you don't. I promise to keep you safe, and I'm not going to break my word. Huh, interesting. Let's press this path of intrigue further. If I were you, I'd keep away from the barrow on the east side of town. It's haunted. Tell me more about this barrow. There ain't much more to tell. They're haunted, and you should stay away. Look. I've seen one of the spirits with my very own eyes. When it glared at me, I swear it burned right through my soul. Do the spirits haunt your town as well? Fortunately, they seem to be sticking to the barrow. I think they're guarding it. Certainly isn't helping my business any. Who'd want to rent a room anywhere near a haunted barrow? Hmm. Well, I could investigate this for you. If you think there's anything you can do, be my guest. Has anyone ever explored the barrow before? About a year or two ago, some fella named Windelius came through. Said he was some kind of a treasure hunter. I warned him not to go in there, just like I warned you. The very next night we heard screams from the barrow, and that was it. We never saw him again. Very curious. A ghost next to the town, unexplained screams in the night, and a man named Windelius, who, even more curiously, arrived in Ivarstead a year or two ago, went into the barrow, and has not been seen since. This is very interesting, as Raider went missing over a year ago. Now, technically, over a year ago could range from anything from one year ago to infinite time ago. But within the acceptable parameters of the English language, the phrase over a year ago means more than one year ago, but less than two years ago. If Raider had been missing for longer, then you'd say she went missing over two years ago, or over three years ago, etc, etc. So it would seem that within the same rough time frame that Raider went missing, well, it's the same rough time frame in which Windelius arrived in Ivarstead. And don't forget, Wilhelm said that he heard screams. So this hits far too close to home for us to not investigate this matter further. 
So naturally, we'll be heading into Shroud Half Barrow, which, as we've established at this point, is literally right next to the town of Ivarstead. Inside the vestibule, we'll find plenty of skeletons, the very same ones that Raider could have used to fake her death that we took a look at earlier. But they are of no matter at present. As we descend into this haunting lair, we will hear a voice. Leave this place. Leave this place. Leave. 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 The ghost of Windelius warning us to leave this place. <laughs> Naturally, we will do just the opposite. When we do push on further, Windelius will actually begin attacking us. Whereupon, unlike Nafi, we will actually fight him back. And with a few good swings, we kill this... Not ghost of Windelius? Oh, seems that killing him had the opposite effect it normally has on people. He went from ghost to man and not the, the other way. I tell you, some of these elves are built different apparently. Weird, but okay. Now, when we search his body within his inventory, we will find something very interesting. A filter of the phantom, which has the effect of making one appear spectral for 30 seconds. Aha! This would explain why he looked ghostly, yet was in fact just a man. So if you are bad at communicating with people, this potion will most certainly assist you in becoming more transparent. But with Windelius out of the way, just a little further into the ruin, we will discover the chambers in which Windelius had made his home. On the ancient stone table, we can find his journal. Let's take a read and see if we can find anything that assists us in getting to the bottom of what happened to Raider. Fourth Era, Year 200, 18 Morning Star. I've set up camp inside the Barrow. This has to be the place. According to all of my research, the burial chamber should be located here. All I need is some time undisturbed to find the claw. It must be hidden here somewhere. 4th era, year 200, the 25th Morning Star. Had a close call today with that fool Wilhelm. He came close to entering the barrow, but I was able to scare him off by rattling some pottery shards in a bag. These people are far too superstitious for their own good. Huh, gives me an idea. 4th era, year 200, 28th of Morning Star. After a few failures, I've come up with a mixture that should do the trick. The glow is perfect. I should look exactly like one of those supposed spirits the people of Ivarstead believe is haunting this barrow. Going to test it out tomorrow. Fourth era, year 229th Morning Star. Success. It worked better than I could have imagined. All I had to do was wander about the entrance to the barrow at night and wave my arms about. I had to stop myself from laughing aloud as they ran away. This should keep them at bay while I continue my search for the claw. Fourth era, U211 of Hearthfire. Almost half a year has passed and there's no sign of the claw or any clues to its whereabouts. This is becoming maddening. It has to be here. Can't risk hiring any assistance, so we'll have to continue alone. Fourth era, U220 Sun's Dusk. It isn't here. It can't be here. This isn't right. It must be the people of Ivarstead. They must be on to my ruse, and they're toying with me. They want to find the burial chamber on their own, and keep the riches for themselves. Fourth era, year 218th of Evening Star. Why are they tormenting me? Why don't they just destroy me? I'm... Who am I? My head's becoming clouded. I can't remember anything. I have to read my journal to remember my purpose. Am I a part of this tomb? Am I meant to guard it? What's becoming of me? First era, year 1050. They shall not take my treasure. They shall all pay dearly for their crimes. Any who set foot within these walls will taste my wrath, my power. I am the guardian of Shroudhearth Barrow. All who oppose me will fall. <laughs> I don't know if anyone knows who Ziltoid is, but <laughs> it sounded a lot like Ziltoid there. Wow, what a journey. So, Windelius came to Shroudhearth Barrow in search of treasures. In particular, 
the Sapphire Dragon Claw, which is nowhere to be seen. But if acquired, it will open up the vaults of this ancient Nordic tomb that are otherwise impassable. Not only that, but importantly, Windelius did not find it, which ultimately led to his descent into madness or possession. We will take a deeper look into the possibility of the possession thing in a minute, as that last journal entry is pretty wacky. Anyway, he came here to find the Sapphire Dragon Claw, set up camp in the Barrow. Interestingly, he mentions that Wilhelm was trying to enter the Barrow, or at least see what was going on in there, but he was able to scare him off by rattling some pottery. But I've got a few questions, one of which is why was Wilhelm skulking around the Barrow in the first place? Was he trying to see if Windelius was alright? I mean, if we think about it, as far as Wilhelm was aware, Windelius arrived in town, went into the barrow, and never came out. So perhaps Wilhelm was having a little sticky beak to try and see what was going on in there. See if Windelius was okay. That is possible. Or was Wilhelm knocking about the barrow because he wanted something from within it? Or was Wilhelm doing something else, like meeting someone outside the barrow? Well, there might be a good reason for Wilhelm being outside. We'll touch on that soon enough when we get to his shopkeeper friend. But for now, Windelius. He pulls a galaxy brain move to prevent or perhaps even better mitigate the issue of nosy townsfolk. So he whips up this little concoction, the filter of the phantom, as to make himself appear as a ghost and frighten the people of Ivarstead. And it worked very well for a time as it evidently had some long-term drawbacks. Then, as Windelius slowly spiralled into a torturous mental abyss believing the people of Ivarstead have the claw and they're toying with him, his memory begins to fog, and then we get this really, truly strange final diary entry that is dated in the first era, in which he says that he has become the guardian of Shroudhearth Barrow. Which sounds rather Sibylline in grandeur. However, I did look into this and I can find no other references in the entirety of the Elder Scrolls universe to a guardian of Shroudhearth Barrow. So I don't know if he has been possessed by some ancient spirit that we simply do not know of, or if his mind has just gone a bit bananas and he's made up a little title for himself. I will say though, within the Elder Scrolls Online, Shroud Half Barrow is accessible, and we actually find it occupied by a Nord necromancer named Jackalor. But unlike Windelius, this warlock Jackalor is not here for riches. He is actually attempting to learn the foregone secrets of the Draugr, as so he may quote unquote resurrect his dead wife. And as creepy as that is, there is absolutely no hide nor hair of him being the guardian of Shroudhearth Barrow, nor is this title mentioned at all anywhere ever. Not only this, but during the events that transpire within the related quest within the Elder Scrolls Online, we end up killing Jackalore. So we know for a fact that he did not remain here and become the guardian of Shroudhearth Barrow. Along with this, The Elder Scrolls Online is set in the second era, year 583. So while it does take place about a thousand years before The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, even here in The Elder Scrolls Online, Jackalore falls about 2000 years short of the first era, year 1050 date that Windelius has written down in his journal. Speaking of which, I also searched the Elder Scrolls timeline and can find nothing of note, nor anything at all around the uh, 1050th year of the first era. So, this guardian of Shroud Half Barrow business appears to not be a case of possession, and if it is, it is not verifiable by any means. Even with the might of the Elder Scrolls lore, history, literature, and games, so it just seems to be some wacky tale of dementia and delusion that Wendelius has cooked up for himself. Now, naturally, with this completely nutty, ghostly, yet not actually a ghost bloke Windelius hanging around Ivarstead, right around the same period Raider went missing in, 
Well, let's pose the burning question we all have, which is, could Windelius be the one that killed Raider? Well, let's take a look at this, because even if he didn't, his arrival may have played a part in it. You see, as we mentioned earlier, the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim starts on this date, the 17th of Last Seed, year 201 of the Fourth Era. As we know, Wilhelm says that Raider went missing over a year ago, so the latest date she could have vanished is exactly one year prior to when the game starts. And assuming that Wilhelm is using the phrase over a year ago properly, we can surmise that Raider has been missing for less than two years. Which means that the earliest date that Raider went missing is one year before the latest date she could have gone missing. And yes, I know that sentence sounds jarringly irregular, but it does make sense. Anyway, let's rely on the visuals for this, because the words ain't working. This then gives us a calendar window of one year, in which at some point something happened to Raider and she vanished. Now with all of this in mind, when exactly did Windelius arrive in Ivar's dead? Well, the best we have is the first diary entry dated on the 200th year of the 4th era on the 18th of Morning Star, which would you look at that, falls right around the middle of the 12 month period in which Raider vanished. So unlike Venaris Vulpin, the vampire we spoke of earlier, the date of Windelius's arrival in Ivarstead actually implicates him rather than releasing him from suspicion. Oh, might be onto something, but let's take a look at the actual evidence here. When we fight Windelius, we see that he uses magic in combat, not archery. And he does not use nor own a bow or iron arrows. So those two iron arrows that we find with Raider's body, they go unexplained. And just to put a rotten snowberry on top of this crumbling cake, even if Windelius did kill Raider, then who called for the assassination of Nafi? Things just don't add up. And, ah, but, Camel, what about the screams? Yes, if you were paying attention to what Wilhelm had to say earlier, then you're probably thinking to yourself, well, what about the screams that Wilhelm heard during the night? Fair question. Let's talk about these supposed screams because there's an issue with them. Just a refresher, when explaining to us the arrival of Windelius in Ivarstead, Wilhelm says this. About a year or two ago, some fella named Windelius came through. Said he was some kind of a treasure hunter. I warned him not to go in there, just like I warned you. The very next night we heard screams from the barrow, and that was it. We never saw him again. So Windelius arrives in Ivarstead, says I'm going to go into the barrow and get the treasure. And then, according to Wilhelm, the very next night screams were heard coming from within the barrow. Naturally, straight away, aha! Windelius killed Raider. We've got a stranger in town, we've got a dead woman Raider, and we have the screaming during the night. It sure seems like the hand that fits the glove seems pretty good at face value. But there is a problem, you see, and that is the contents of Windelius's journal. As he writes down all kinds of mundane stuff. He set up camp, he scared Wilhelm off by rattling some pottery, he spooked the townsfolk, he made a magic potion that makes him look like a ghost, blah 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 blah. But at no point does Windelius mention seeing Raider, at no point does he mention encountering Raider, at no point does he mention killing Raider, at no point does he mention seeing anyone apart from Wilhelm and the townsfolk that he's scared. He didn't kill anyone, he didn't encounter anyone, no one came into the barrow, at no point does he mention himself screaming, nor does he mention anyone else screaming. He doesn't mention fighting anyone, he doesn't mention killing anyone, let alone he does not mention killing Raider. Windelius does mention that seven days after his arrival in Ivarstead, he managed to scare off Wilhelm by rattling some pots. He does mention that four days later he spooked the townsfolk with his ghost potion, but there is nothing written even within the first week of when Windelius arrived let alone the day slash night after he arrived, which is supposedly when, according to Wilhelm, these screams from the barrow occurred. 
So why is there no mention of the screams in the journal of the guy who was in the barrow and jotted down every little detail? It just, once again, does not add up. So with that said, I do believe Windelius to be totally innocent of the murder of Raider. I think he's completely nuts, but I don't think he killed Raider. But now that we're here, let's not take our gaze off of the innkeeper who seems to be at the center of everything we look at. Why would Wilhelm mention screaming in the night if there weren't any as far as we can tell? Is he lying? Is he misremembering? Is he just wrong? Is he being dramatic and apocryphal? You know, simply making stuff up and embellishing details for the purposes of a good ghost story? Or is Wilhelm trying to cover something up? Trying to make us connect two dots that aren't related? Well, if that is the case, the only reason I can think of is if Wilhelm is hiding something. What if Wilhelm was involved with Raider's death? And to totally divert our attention from him, he tells us that there were screams during the night when the strange man arrived in town. The purpose of this lie is so that we add two and two together. Girl goes missing over a year ago, Windelius appears in Ivarstead over a year ago, so they're in the same place at the same time. Then what happens? Screams are heard by Wilhelm during the night, and Raider is never seen again. Not only is Wilhelm telling us that he was absent from the scene of the screams, i.e. he was in the inn, but he is also very subtly serving to us a culprit on a silver platter. Unfortunately for him, according to Windelius' journal, no such screams ever took place on said night. And if we cannot explain these screams in game, we will just have to explain them as an easter egg. After all, they are the Wilhelm screams. <coughs> So what an oblivion is actually going on here? Well, I admit, at face value, Wilhelm is just a friendly and helpful innkeeper. But there are some suspicious facets about him. So now that we're here to deconstruct and psychoanalyze Wilhelm, there is something we should definitely bring into the light, something rather telling and very odd indeed. So strange, in fact, that it was actually flagged as a bug and removed from the game by the Skyrim unofficial patch. But I am certain that this is not a bug, and for really good reason too, as I will show you in a second. So, during the quest, The Straw That Broke, the one that Nafi gives us to find his missing sister, Raider, we discover her skeleton in the river, we retrieve her necklace from her satchel, and then we take it back to Nafi. Upon showing him the necklace, he will say this. Raider! You saw Raider? Did you tell her Narfi cries? Did you tell her Narfi never said goodbye like mother and father? A sad yet classically wacky line from Narfi, but get this. Before we take the necklace to Narfi, we can actually stop in at the Villamir Inn and show it to Wilhelm. Whereupon, Wilhelm says this. Raider, you saw Raider. Did you tell her Narfi cries? Did you tell her Narfi never said goodbye like mother and father? Weird, right? Wilhelm says literally word for word what Narfi says when you show him Raider's necklace and tell him that she's dead. Why? Well, why indeed? As mentioned, this event is so weird that it was actually flagged as a bug and removed with the unofficial patch. However, I am certain it is not a bug. And there are several reasons for this. One, it's not the same voice actor. Wilhelm and Narfi are voiced by two different people. Narfi is voiced by William Salyers, who does all of the drunk male voices in-game, and Wilhelm is voiced by Michael Goch, who does the majority of the classic male Nord voices that we hear in Skyrim. Now, the reason that's important is because it means that the developers didn't just accidentally add one of Narfi's voice lines to Wilhelm. No, 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 no. The developers at Bethesda made sure that these two different voice actors voice acting for two different characters, both voiced and recorded this specific line of dialogue. Raider, you saw Raider? Did you tell her Narfi cries? Did you tell her Narfi never said goodbye like mother and father? Raider, you saw Raider? Did you tell her Narfi cries? Did you tell her Narfi never said goodbye like mother and father? And then intentionally added them to the right characters. Along with adding the option to show the necklace to Wilhelm to trigger the line in the first place, 
and type out all the subtitles and so on and so forth. Like there's a lot of steps in making something like this happen. So someone at BGS went to some purposeful effort to make sure this strange interaction existed. So for once, for once with a BGS game, this is not a bug, but a feature. And one that sheds some light on Wilhelm. As sure, at face value, like, oh, that's weird. But let's sweep face value aside. Why would Wilhelm be repeating that tortured dialogue from Narfi? This is pretty damn odd, right? Well, some say that Raider was a witch, which is totally plausible as we explored earlier. But the idea here that I read online is that Raider cursed her necklace somehow, and that's why Wilhelm says Narfi's dialogue. As you can probably guess, this does not tickle my fancy at all, because there is no evidence that this necklace is cursed. And also, if we're going to make up a story with no evidence, we can do way better than that. Luckily for you, we do do way better than that, and with evidence. So why would Wilhelm say this line? Well, I think that Wilhelm repeats Narfi's tortured dialogue, because Wilhelm is suffering from some kind of crushing guilt. He was somehow involved in Raider's death, and he feels bad. He's haunted by it. And on top of this, every single day, the madman Nafi just mopes about town, desperately screaming after his sister Raider over and over. It's a non-stop reminder constantly refreshing Wilhelm's memory of his devious deeds, actions, and guilt for not only the death of Raider, but also the long-lasting effects it's had on her brother, who, through her disappearance, has been sent down a manic spiral of grief and despair, so steep that he's now nothing more than a drunken beggar living in a ruin alone. Nafi has become a truly sad man. And if this was all caused by the death of Raider, Whose doing was Narfi's descent into madness? Well, it would be the person that killed Raider. And who's the person that not only shows some kind of guilt, but delivers a truly strange outburst of adopted lament? That's right, Wilhelm. And why would Wilhelm bear this remorseful sorrow? because he is guilty in one way or another in regards to Raider's disappearance. So if that is true, what was Wilhelm's part in this? What did he do? What does he know that torments his good conscience so much that when we show him Raider's necklace, he reverts to gibbering and jabbering Nafi's tortured words to us? Well, I've cooked up several theories for you. The first of which involves Windelius and Shroudhearth Barrow. As Raider and Wilhelm may have been working together. You see, there is a strange revelation that rears its head once we clear Shroudhearth Barrow by killing Windelius and then return his journal to Wilhelm and tell him the news. This is the conversation that ensues. Wilhelm, I found this in Shroudhearth Barrow. Let me see that. I can't believe this. It was all just a fabrication of this Windelius character. I can't believe we were so stupid. Well, least I can do is give you something for taking care of him. If you won't accept it as a payment, consider it a gift. Then the quest is complete. Wilhelm rewards us done and dusted. But wait, what was the reward for the quest? The Sapphire Dragon Claw? What in oblivion is going on around here? The Sapphire Dragon Claw is what Windelius came to Iverstead for. He spent almost 18 months holed up in Shroudhearth Barrow and was sent quite literally insane searching for this very item. That what? Wilhelm had the whole time? This thing that he just willy-nilly hands to us for doing a fairly basic quest? I mean, why not just sell it to Windelius in the first place? He clearly doesn't have much issue parting with it. He just gave it to us, which is weird in itself, but how did Wilhelm get the claw? Did he steal it from under Windelius's nose? And that's why he was poking around the barrow that night in which Windelius had to rattle the pottery to scare him off? Or has he had it for longer? Maybe it's a family heirloom, maybe it's a totally innocent. Or maybe Wilhelm has plundered the barrow before. In fact, there is very good evidence for this. You know what, let's take a look at that now, as it reveals far more than we expect. And one of the weirdest twists in this tale. For this, we will need to head to the city of Riften, the capital city of the Hold of the Rift. 
Once here, we need to make our way to the general goods store, which is called the Pawned Prawn. This is run by Bercy Honeyhand and his wife, Dreefa. Now in here, atop the wooden shop front, we can find a note titled An Apology, which reads, Bercy, I got your last request, but there's no way I'm going near Shroud Hearth Barrow. I know that the trinkets from the Nordic Barrows sell quite well, but it isn't worth getting killed. You probably think I'm crazy, but I'm certain that the place is haunted and I refuse to become another victim of of whatever lives in there. Sorry, old friend, Wilhelm. Very curious indeed. So Bercy Honeyhands, the shopkeeper here in Riften, has been using or at least asking his friend Wilhelm to go into Shroudhearth Barrow and collect ancient Nordic trinkets and artifacts, as so he can sell them at his store. This might explain a few things, as there was something that I noticed in Vilamir Inn that annoyed me. Not so much annoyed me, it was annoying that I couldn't figure out its purpose. And that is behind Wilhelm, there are a bunch of buckets scattered all over the floor. Too many buckets, some might even say. Maybe Wilhelm was using these to carry items out of Shroudhearth Barrow to then send them off for Bercy to sell at the Pawned Prawn. While it's not mentioned in the letter, we can assume that Wilhelm gets a cut, if not a substantial cut of the profits, considering he's doing all of the legwork. Totally plausible, but if you do have another explanation for why there's a million buckets behind Wilhelm, please tell me. Thank you. Anyway, from the letter, we learn that Wilhelm refuses to go back into Shroudhearth Barrow as he thinks it's haunted. After Windelius disappearing and after Wilhelm seeing what he thought was a ghost. But then in the note, Wilhelm says, I refuse to become another victim of whatever lives in there. Now, straight away, our minds go to a victim? Oh, well, who's the victim? He must be talking about Raider. And he might be, but I don't think so. As it seems much more likely that Wilhelm is talking about Windelius when referencing a victim of the Barrow. Because from Wilhelm's point of view, Windelius went into the barrow and never came out. Therefore, Windelius, in Wilhelm's eyes, is a victim of the barrow. Although it is technically possible he could be referencing Raider, but as far as we know, she didn't die in the barrow. But what this letter does tell us is why Wilhelm was potentially knocking around the barrow that night to gather trinkets to pass on to Bercy to sell so they could both get money. That's one reason, but it also gives us a potential 200 IQ reason as to why Wilhelm gives us the Sapphire Dragon Claw, but didn't give it to nor mention it to Windelius, as Windelius openly claims that he was a treasure hunter. Well, if Wilhelm is making money off of the treasure within Shroudhearth Barrow, by collecting it, sending it to Bercy, Bercy sells it at the Pawned Prawn, and then both Bercy and Wilhelm get a cut of the gold. So with that in mind, he obviously wouldn't want Windelius to have access to its vaults, which requires the Sapphire Dragon Claw to open. So it's actually within Wilhelm's interests to make sure that Windelius does not get his hands on the Sapphire Dragon Claw, as so that he cannot plunder all of the wealth from it. But Wilhelm happily gives the Sapphire Dragon Claw to us. Well, least I can do is give you something for taking care of him. If you won't accept it as a payment, consider it a gift. Why? Well, as far as Wilhelm knows, we are not a treasure hunter. But instead, we are a capable hero. A capable hero who would be able to go into Shroudhearth Barrow, use the Sapphire Dragon Claw to open up the sealed vaults, go through and kill everything that moves in there and completely clear it of enemies and threats. And sure, we'll likely take some gold and bits and pieces along the way, but what does this leave Wilhelm? Well, it leaves him the perfect business opportunity at his doorstep. We've unlocked the vaults, We've made it completely safe, it's completely enemy free, and it's filled with all of the loot that we couldn't carry out. AKA, it's an entirely risk-free treasure trove at Wilhelm's front door. And I think that that is why Wilhelm happily hands us the Sapphire Dragon Claw after we proved ourselves in defeating Windelius, 
Therefore, he gives it to us knowing we'll go in and clear the place out. But when Windelis arrived, he said, I am a treasure hunter and I am going into that barrow to get the treasure. Therefore, Wilhelm most certainly did not want Windelius to get access to the Sapphire Dragon Claw. But this raises the questions. How did Wilhelm get a hold of the Sapphire Dragon Claw? And if you're wondering to yourself, what the hell does this have to do with Raider? Fair question. Well, there is something really weird that I want to show you. As in the Skyrim Creation Kit, if we look at Shroud Half Barrow, and specifically the room where Windelius set up his camp, we can see that on the same table as his journal, sitting right there, is the Sapphire Dragon Claw. Why is it here in the creation kit, but it's not in the game? And I did check this. I started a brand new character and used console commands to teleport straight to Shroud Half Barrow. And at no point does the Sapphire Dragon Claw sit here, where it is in the creation kit, in the game. So was the claw here or not? I'm not sure, but it's pretty dang weird and I don't really have an explanation for it. Other than the devs might have had other plans compared to what we do find here in game. So straight out of the gate, that's weird. But now let's take a look at another theory to do with the Sapphire Dragon Claw, Wilhelm and Raider. As we know, Nafi lives in what remains of his parents' farmhouse. Well, are we to assume that Raider also lived here? Maybe. From what we know, Raider wasn't rolling in money either. I mean, she went and collected ingredients. You know, no one says, oh, she was the local blacksmith or something like that. But I will say that in Nafi's house, there's one bedroll. And if he's waiting for his sister to get back, then where's her bed? Well, if Raider didn't live at home with Nafi, then she would have lived in the Villamere Inn as several of the other townsfolk do who don't have their own house. And in Villamere Inn, there are also several beds and bed rolls that are not owned by any one character, but rather they are tagged as being owned by the Ivarstead faction. Meaning that yes, Raider living in Villamere Inn, or at least sleeping here, is totally possible and probably more likely than living in that ruin that Nafi lives in. And if she did live here, then it means she would have been around Wilhelm. And if she's around Wilhelm all the time, then Wilhelm might have got a sniff of her magic capabilities. Well, with this in mind, we can thread several weaves that lead to the same place. So if Wilhelm wanted to get the Sapphire Claw out of Shroud Half Barrow before Windelius got his hands on it, he'd need to go into the barrow. But what if he hired someone to go and get it for him? Someone he knew from around town. Someone who he knew had some kind of ability to sneak in somewhere, and someone who was probably poor and needed the money. Well, a great potential candidate for this would have been Raider. Not only this, but Raider could have used her alchemy knowledge to make an invisibility potion, which would explain why Windelius never mentions her in his journal, because he never saw her. Now, just FYI, to back this up a little bit more, there are six alchemy ingredients that carry the invisibility effect. You only need two of them to make a potion, and Raider had access to four of them. Known Root, which she has right next to her house and on the island from which she gathered ingredients, Lunar Moth Wings, which she could have gotten from the same island or from the Alchemist Shack, both of which are places where Lunar Moths spawn during the night. And then there's Ice Wraith Teeth and Vampire Dust. Now these do not have an apparent source, but they are in the loot pool that Nafi rewards us with, which as we've established earlier, were of course Raider's ingredients, as it's the only plausible explanation as how Nafi, a poor man who serves no purpose apparently, would have access to these very rare ingredients. So Raider had the knowledge, the ingredients and the means and the motive to make a potion of invisibility which she could have used to sneak into the barrow and out of the barrow with the Sapphire Dragon Claw. Now, we know that nothing happened to Raider within the barrow, as there is no mention of such an event in the Journal of Windelius. So if something went wrong, it would have been afterwards, once she got back to Wilhelm. 
So did Wilhelm get the claw from her and then shoot her with arrows and dump her body in the river? Well, it is possible as behind Vilimir Inn, there is a wooden cart that has no apparent purpose. But the back of the inn, where there are no guards patrolling and no one else can see there, well, it's a really good place to meet up with someone, exchange goods, and then kill them. And then, oh, look, this handy wooden cart. Let me lift the body in there, wheel it over to this perfect ledge, and tip a corpse into the river. And get this, this drop-off point is within the green area that we spoke of earlier when talking about where Raider's body could have entered the water, given the direction the current flows in. So I'm not saying by any means this is what happened, but it is possible, and it fits within the rules. And I'm not fully sold on Wilhelm hiring Raider to steal the claw, but again, it is possible. But regardless of whether or not we accept that theory, I do believe that Wilhelm had a much better motive for wanting Raider dead. As we've established and delved deep into, Raider was at the very least an apt alchemist who could have been some kind of witch dealing with a coven and hagravens, collecting ingredients, performing rituals, something to do with the magical arts. All of which are things that some people consider witchy. With this in mind, think about this. We have a small town that is apparently down on its luck, which we learn from Wilhelm when he talks about how bad business is, Certainly isn't helping my business any. Who'd want to rent a room anywhere near a haunted barrow? The farmer Boaty even describes Ivarstead as a backwards little town. Pilgrim or not, if I were you, I'd move right through our backwards little town. Well, backwards little towns with tiny populations that are down on their luck can get dangerously superstitious especially in this medieval fantasy setting. You know, women are killed for even being suspected of a witch, let alone when they are actually expressing skills in the Kabbalistic arts. And let us not forget that when Delius says in his journal, and I quote, these people are far too superstitious for their own good. And talking about the population of Ivarstead. So if someone were to know about Raider and her witchy endeavors, well, this could most certainly give a superstitious townsfolk, in their eyes of course, a really good reason to want Raider dead. But no one in Ivarstead shows this disdain for all things occult, except for one. That's right, it's Wilhelm. As when we ask him where we can learn more about magic, he will respond with this. Sir, I've got no interest in magic users. No use for their kind at all. They're way up north in Winterhold, and that's fine with me. I don't even like our Jarl having a court wizard. So Wilhelm openly bears disdain to folk who dabble in the arcane, magical, occult, and mysterious arts. He's got no interest in magic users. He's got no use for their kind at all. He says they're in Winterhold and he likes the fact that they're nowhere near him. And he's even upset that Riften has a court wizard. That being Willandria, who I believe is the one that trained Raider in the Kabbalistic and particularly the alchemical arts. But we will look into the reason for that later because that's intertwined in the Sheogorath rabbit hole that I've mentioned a few times. For now though, we know for certain that Wilhelm could have very well wanted Raider dead, just for her proclivities in alchemy and perhaps other magical facets. Now, to take this even further, Wilhelm owns one book. While there are a few books in the guest rooms within the inn, these don't belong to Wilhelm. Again, Wilhelm owns one single book and it can be found beneath the wooden bar that he stands at. Now there are 337 readable books and 820 readable pieces of literature within the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. And which one just so happens to be literally the only book that Wilhelm owns? Herbane's Bestiary, Hagravens. Hmm, interesting. It's a book that tells the tale of Herbane killing a Hagraven and a coven of witches. Now, to be clear, Herbane's Bestiary series are helpful guides on how to defeat certain enemies, but there are only three of them. Ice Wraiths, Hagravens, and Automatons. So if Wilhelm here did want to read up on how to take out a witch, or whatever he thought Raider was, this book here, Herbane's Bestiary, Hagravens, would be 
the most plausible book for him to have out of all the books in Skyrim. Or maybe he knew about Raider visiting the Hag Ravens at Orphan Rock and thought she was one. Or maybe he's just a silly old superstitious villager who thought the woman mixing potions and wandering off into the wilderness was a Hag Raven. Whatever the reason, I find it very, very, very strange that the only person that exudes any sort of guilt about Raider's death, as seen when we showed him the necklace... Raider? You saw Raider? Did you tell her Narfi cries? Did you tell her Narfi never said goodbye like mother and father? Is the same guy that has a venomous hatred towards the arcane arts and those who use them. Sir, I've got no interest in magic users. No use for their kind at all. And just so happens to only own one book, which is about killing hag ravens and witch covens. I mean, hmm, alarm bells are ringing. Now, let's talk about the Iron Arrows, as I haven't conveniently forgotten about those pesky suckers. So Raider's body is found with two Iron Arrows. So does Wilhelm own a bow or Iron Arrows? Well, the answer to this is a disappointing and rather confusing no. However, there is something annoyingly strange that you have already seen although I didn't mention it at the time, so I'd be curious to know which of you spotted this little detail. If we go back to the pawned prawn in Riften, the note that Wilhelm sent Bercy has something near it. Two things, in fact. On either side of Wilhelm's letter are two iron arrows. There's not three arrows, there's not one arrow, there's not ten. They aren't elven arrows, they are not glass arrows, they are not steel arrows. But instead, there are two iron arrows resting here with Wilhelm's letter. In fact, if we think about the way these two iron arrows are placed, they are literally framing Wilhelm's notes. A metaphor, perhaps, to how these two iron arrows have framed Wilhelm. And to make it less coincidental, uh, Bercy does not sell any bows nor does he sell or own any other types of arrows, nor does he have any other iron arrows. The only two archery related things in his shop are these two iron arrows that could be anywhere in the shop, anywhere, but they just so happen to be accompanying Wilhelm's letter. Now I'm not going to say that these are proof of anything, but they sure are curious, especially amidst a sea of theories that all seem to lack iron arrows. But let's entertain this for a moment. Why would these two iron arrows be here with Wilhelm's letter? Perhaps Wilhelm ordered four of them from Bercy, only used two, and then sent the other two back with his letter. Maybe the two iron arrows are Wilhelm's calling card. Maybe it's a subtle hint left by a developer. Maybe it's nothing and just a particularly suspicious coincidence. Or maybe it's a pun. If we follow the arrows, the arrows will lead to the truth. And if we think about it, the arrows above Raider's corpse, they float east towards Riften. And if we follow those arrows, we technically land at these arrows, which are literally framing a letter from Wilhelm. I don't know if this is some galaxy brain pun that a dev put in here, or if it's nothing at all. Anyway, Wilhelm seems like a pretty nice guy at face value, right? He's not mean or cruel or rude, which I think makes it slightly difficult to imagine him organizing Raider's death. But we do have reason to think he would have wanted Raider dead, given his hatred of all occult dabblers and of course the book he's reading, which is literally about hunting witches and hag ravens. However, besides the suspicious out of sight wooden cart around the back of the inn and the two iron arrows found in the pawned prawn next to Wilhelm's letter, we don't really have any actual evidence that Wilhelm killed her. But this actually opens a new door, which leads to what I believe to be the most likely theory one which is much more fun. I think Raider may have been assassinated by the Dark Brotherhood on the request of Wilhelm. It might sound a bit far-fetched, but this requires motive, money, and connections. All things that Wilhelm has, as we're about to learn. But first, let's get a true vibe for who Wilhelm really is. 
what he's really like, and what he's really up to. If we head to Riften and visit the Blackbriar Meadery, once we enter the premises, we can find a Dunmer Brewer who goes by the name of Romlin Dreth. Who, by the way, is the descendant of Valendreth, that insufferable Greyskin who occupies the cell across from you at the beginning of the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. Although we can rest easy, as Romlin Dreth is much nicer than his ancestor. Let's have a chat with him. Romlin, my boy, do you work for the Meadery? Sure. How do you think I get my hands on the good stuff and offer it so cheap? You think Old Maven is just giving it away to anyone? Good thing she makes so much money. Makes it easier for merchandise like this to fall through the cracks. Nothing but the best. Black Briar Mead, fresh from the vat. Best of all, you don't have to pay the ridiculous prices Maven charges. So what do you say to that? You're selling cheap mead. No, no, friend. You've got it all wrong. I'm not selling cheap mead. I'm selling good mead for cheap. Black Briar Mead. I sell cases of it for half of what the inns and taverns pay through the meadery. All I need is someone to deliver it for me. If anyone saw me leave Riften, they get suspicious. What kind of delivery? I need someone to take this small keg of Blackbriar mead to Wilhelm at the Villamer Inn in Arverstead. Drop it off and he'll trade you something for the delivery. Keep it as payment for the legwork. Oh, and if you bump into Indarin from the meadery, keep your mouth shut. He'd write us out in a second. Yeah, all right. I'll do it. Good. Now get going. Hmm, interesting. It seems that Wilhelm has some underground connections and is not adverse to doing some illegal and dodgy black market trading. So let's head back to Ivarstead and deliver Wilhelm this mead. I have a delivery from Romlin. All right, pipe down. You want the whole blessed place to hear you? The arrangement called for a trade. I hope you'll find this suitable. Oh, curious, and look what he rewards us with, a gold and emerald circlet. That's definitely something most innkeepers have. Hmm, just more riches that Wilhelm just so happens to have. Almost like he's been plundering Nordic tombs, collecting valuables, and making a bunch of money off it. So from this small quest, we can see that Wilhelm is no stranger to secret deals and under-the-table trades while also being capable of providing valuables as a reward. AKA, he's got the money to pay for an assassination. That was one of the issues. 750 gold, not everyone's got that to dish out. Well, suddenly we've learned that Wilhelm does have the gold to dish out. But there is something else that bolsters all of these points, and we need to take a look at it. Have you ever wondered what the deal is with Lindley Starsung? The bard who lives and works with Wilhelm at the Villamir Inn. Ever wonder if there is more to her story? Well, if we head back to Riften and make our way to Mistvale Keep, after going up the stairs, instead of going through the front doors, we can actually head down the right, where we can walk down some stairs and enter the Riften Jail, where we will find many fine folk. But we want to have a chat with this guy. Sibby Blackbriar, who is slimier than a slode. Well, well, aren't you a sight for sore eyes? I've always got time for lovely ladies. Ugh, why are you in jail? Look, we all have our flaws. Mine is that women can't get enough of me. So I had this little affair going on while I was betrothed to a beautiful girl named Sviddy. Well, she finds out and she tells her brother, Wolfer, that her brother attacks me with a knife. I, I mean, I had to defend myself. So you got arrested for his murder. Exactly. And now I have to stare at these bars for eight months. Can you believe it? I was about to let that wench marry into the richest family in Riften, and this is how she repays me. I'd do anything to have that whore's head on a platter. All I need to know is where she is. Yeah, I'll help you find her. Ah, that's the spirit. Find her and I promise you'll be well compensated. Do you have any information on Sviti? She was a young woman, buxom with long flowing black hair. She used to sing the most lovely songs to me when we were courting. 
I've never heard a voice so beautiful. All that talent will go to waste when I'm finished with her. You are serving only eight months for murder? Yeah, mother thought I should be taught a lesson for airing the family's dirty laundry in public. I mean, I've taken care of many people for her in the past. What in oblivion did she expect me to do? Ah, well, at least I have all the comforts of home during my stay. Well, except the touch of a woman, of course. Tell me about your family. When speaking of the Blackbriars, only one thought should spring to mind. We are not to be trifled with. Help us, you end up rich. Cross us, and you'll end up a memory. Is that enough information for you? When I find that bitch, I'm gonna wring her little neck. Jesus, all right, chill, bro. So this woman, Speedy, that Sibi was going to marry is quite the hot potato. Where could she be hiding? Well, it turns out that Sfiddy is actually Linley Starsung, the bard from Villamir Inn. If you fancy a bit of music, let me know. Your real name is Sfiddy, isn't it? No, I'm sorry. You must have me mistaken for someone else. I've never even heard that name before. You have nothing to fear from me. You are way too valuable. I'm sorry, I don't know what you're talking about. Ah, fine. Gotta use the Intimidate perk. Stop lying or I'll beat it out of you. Please, I beg you. Don't tell Sibi where I am. He'll kill me. Sibi's been spreading lies about me. You must hear me out. Please, go ahead. I'm all ears. Tell me your side of the story about Sibi. Sibi and I were to be married. We were supposed to be happy together forever. Then I found that wretched poetry from Svana. When I confronted Sibi about it, he threatened to kill me. I was scared, so I told my brother Wulfur. He went to talk to Sibi for me and... and... Sibi killed him. My brother wasn't even armed. When I heard what Sibi did, I fled. And now you've found me, and you're going to tell him where I am. Not today, sister. You are way too valuable to this investigation. So, Sfidi fled Riften in fear of the wrath of the Blackbriar family, aka likely death, torture, god knows what. She donned the name Linley Starsong and moved in here at Villamir Inn to live in secret as a bard. That is all well and good, but guess what? Wilhelm is in on it, as in the creation kit we can see Linley's relationships with other characters. She only has two relationships with other characters. One is Wilhelm, one is Bercy, both of whom are labelled as a confidant, which to be clear means a person with whom one shares a secret or private matter, trusting them not to repeat it to others. So Wilhelm knows who Linley truly is. Not only this, but she has one other confidant, which is Bercy. Bercy, the shopkeeper at the Pawned Prawn that we looked at earlier, the one that works with Wilhelm. Now, if you don't know, Bercy openly and vocally despises the corruption within Riften, as we can overhear himself and his wife Drefa talking about this. They keep giving and giving, Bercy, and they'll keep taking and taking. When is it going to end? What would you have me do, woman? Cross the guild? Take them all on one by one? You know, I don't mean that. We need to find a way out of this. Perhaps talk to Layla. Layla is as clueless as she's stupid. No, if anything's to be done about this, we have to deal with it ourselves. And we can also ask him about it. So what's wrong with Riften? <laughs> the question is, what isn't wrong with Riften? This city is corrupt, rotten to the core. No one cares about anything except themselves, and how much coin they can make off the misery of others. Maybe you should speak to the authorities. Authorities? Have you been listening to what I said? They're all dirty. Every one of them. The only way to get things done in this city is to keep your head down and pay off the right people. So as we can see, Bercy clearly hates all of the corruption that is within Riften. And before we go on, I just want to point out like a little easter egg I found by accident while looking around his shop for more arrows or bows. 
And that is on the top shelf, we can find two iron daggers that are crossed over each other, which actually generate the image that is on the banner of the rift. So there's a cool little Easter egg for you that I found along the way. But yes, Bercy hates the corruption within Riften. And what greater force of corruption is there than the Black Briar family? So given this stance that Bercy has, the fact that both Bercy and Wilhelm are tagged as Linley's confidants, we can deduce that Sviddy slash Linley was terrified for her life. Her brother had just been murdered after she found out that her betrothed had been cheating on her. She'd lost the family she'd gained through love and she'd lost her actual family. So who does she turn to? Well, she turned to Bercy, who openly hates the Black Prize and openly hates all the corruption. Because of this, he was happy to help Linley escape, probably just as an up you to the Blackbriar family. And he did this by hooking her up with his best mate, Wilhelm, where she could rather, to be honest, dangerously live in secret as a bard. Well, with all this new knowledge, it makes this line that Wilhelm says make a lot more sense. I won't go over there ever again. See that you don't. I promise to keep you safe, and I'm not going to break my word. Wilhelm promised to keep Linley safe for Bercy. However, I think there's a little bit more in it for Wilhelm than just helping a friend out. Because given the imminent threat of the Black Briars finding out about this covert operation, well, it's really risky for Wilhelm to do this. So there must be something in it for him, because the Black Briars, you don't mess with the Black Briars. Be careful, Mule. The Thieves' Guild has Maven Blackbriar at its back. One snap of her fingers and you could end up in Riften Jail. Or worse. When speaking of the Blackbriars, only one thought should spring to mind. We are not to be trifled with. Mm. Help us, you end up rich. Cross us, and you'll end up a memory. Nothing gets done without my approval in this city. I have the Jarl's ear and the guards in my pocket. Looking to stay alive? Anyone makes Why trouble for chance? me and I pay a visit to the Thieves' Guild. Make me angry and I contact the Dark Brotherhood. You do well to remember that the next time you make such a buying, stupid selling, observation. One, they're really dangerous, and they're also like the most powerful family in Skyrim. So there must be something in it for him. Now, another thing to not forget is that Linley slash Svidi was within the richest family in the Rift and perhaps even Skyrim. AKA, I bet that she's got some cash. You know, the classic son of a mega rich family has earned none of it himself, but has more family money than he knows what to do with. He wants to impress a lady, so he buys and gifts her jewelry and gems and gold and stuff like that. You know, that's a pretty familiar concept that I'm sure we're all well aware of. So with this in mind, I believe that Wilhelm is being paid to keep Linley here, which is a fair trade. To be honest, there's a payment for a service. And to back this up, Wilhelm will always be carrying gems in his inventory. It's not something your average innkeeper has at hand. On top of this, Wilhelm is the only innkeeper in the entire game to have anything in his inventory beyond just average random items that an innkeeper would have. I went through the creation kit and I checked every single innkeeper within Skyrim. I checked their inventories and guess what? The only one of them to carry anything out of the ordinary and therefore the only innkeeper to carry gemstones is Wilhelm which means that a developer at Bethesda Game Studios had to specifically add gemstones to his loot pool. Now, why would a developer do that? To insinuate that Wilhelm has got riches. He's got money, he's got gems, he's got treasure, he's being paid, something along those lines. So from this, I believe that Linley Starsung slash Svidi is paying Wilhelm in gems and gold and bits of jewelry that she was probably either gifted by her rich ex-partner Sibby Blackbriar, that slime ball in the prison, or she stole them from the Blackbriar family before escaping to Ivarstead. That is the most logical way that I can explain why Wilhelm would take a huge risk 
of harboring Linley here when the Blackbriar family is looking for her. And along with this, he's the only innkeeper in the game to, mm, oh, just so happen to be in the possession of gemstones, which are, of course, valuable and not something you'd expect an innkeeper to have on them. When was the last time you checked into a hotel and the cloak had diamonds in his pockets? Hmm, exactly. Which then of course gives Wilhelm the means to pay for the Dark Brotherhood assassinations. Now, you might be thinking yes, but to get the Dark Brotherhood to kill someone for you, you need to perform the Black Sacrament. The ritual in which the invoker, that being the person wanting the contract to be made, creates an effigy of their victim, assembled from body parts, including a heart, a skull, bones, and human flesh. The effigy must then be encircled with candles, then the ritual may commence. The invoker must proceed by repeatedly stabbing the effigy with a dagger that has been rubbed with the petals of the nightshade flower while whispering the chant, Sweet mother, sweet mother, send your children unto me, for the sins of the unworthy must be baptized in blood and fear. It's quite the ordeal, but the problem is, there is no sign of such a ritual occurring within the inn or just anywhere near Wilhelm or in Ivarstead. Although Wilhelm does own a dagger and that can be found in his bedroom, but all the other way more crucial components are missing. Which of course, straight away we think, okay, this could put a handbrake on this theory, but in fact it actually does not. Because there is one rather major and very crucial detail that everyone, including myself most of the time, seems to forget. And that is, at the time that the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim takes place, the Dark Brotherhood has been shattered, scattered, mostly destroyed. They're in a complete state of disarray. Many of the sanctuaries around Tamriel have been raided, cleared out, and destroyed. Now, because of this, the Dark Brotherhood does not have a listener until we, the player character, progress through the Dark Brotherhood questline and become the new and only listener. The Night Mother speaks only to the listener! And there is no listener! This is very important because when someone performs the Black Sacrament, the Night Mother hears their plea. But the Night Mother can only speak to a listener. And the listener then tells the different heads of sanctuaries who needs to be killed and whatnot. So the only people that the Night Mother can communicate with are listeners. And guess what? When you don't have a listener, just as the Dark Brotherhood does not have a listener in Skyrim, well, yeah, guess what? All of those black sacraments will go unfulfilled. In fact, we can even find the remains of a black sacrament ritual in the basement of the Blackbriar Manor in Riften, which has a letter next to it, which reads, Astrid. I thought your people were supposed to be reliable. I've performed the Black Sacrament, I've paid the proper penance, and I've waited patiently for results. If you can't handle a simple assassination, I will find someone who can. I want this contract handled, and I want it handled immediately. Signed, Maven Blackbriar. Which just goes to show my point. With no Dark Brotherhood listener, no contracts are achieved, heard, or executed through the Black Sacrament ritual which in turn means that all of the contracts that we get in the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim prior to us becoming the new listener were all put into motion through word of mouth. So Nafi's contract, along with Raider's contract, if she was assassinated, are both Dark Brotherhood contracts that were acquired by word of mouth, not through the Black Sacrament. Therefore, there being no evidence whatsoever of Wilhelm performing the Black Sacrament ritual actually makes total sense. His potential contract on Raider and his potential contract on Nafi were both achieved by whispering into the right ears. With this in mind, who in Ivarstead has the best contacts and constant interactions with all kinds of strange folk from across Tamriel? Wilhelm. He works the inn, so he meets everyone, he meets all kinds of people who stay at the establishment, and not only that, but as we've established, he is connected. He knows people. 
And now to add a gilded snowberry onto this pie of deception, once we complete the Dark Brotherhood's main quest line, we can get a repeatable quest called the Dark Brotherhood Forever, in which we have to go out and meet someone who has a contract they wish fulfilled. And guess what? One of only a handful of these meeting places is the Villamere Inn. Wilhelm's establishment is literally a meeting place for Dark Brotherhood clients and Dark Brotherhood assassins. So, what have we discovered? Wilhelm has the motive to wish Raider assassinated as he despises the arcane arts and those who practice them. The only book he owns is a book about hunting and killing Hagravens and witches. He also shows huge signs of immense guilt over Raider's death as shown by him mimicking word for word Narfi's tortured dialogue when we show him Raider's necklace. We know Wilhelm is comfortable doing some shady stuff. He's stealing relics out of the Nordic tombs and selling them off to Bercy. He's harboring a runaway woman who is being hunted by the most powerful families in Skyrim. He's also buying stolen goods in the form of Blackbriar Mead from Rumlin Dreth. And what is one of the few meeting places of Dark Brotherhood clients and Dark Brotherhood assassins? His inn, Wilhelm's inn, the Villamere inn is a meeting place for the Dark Brotherhood. So Wilhelm has the means, Wilhelm has the motives, Wilhelm has the money, and Wilhelm has the connections to achieve an assassination via the Dark Brotherhood, notably without requiring the Black Sacrament. Which is especially exciting because this would exempt him from the need for us to connect the Iron Arrows to him. Why do we not need to do this? Because they were not his. Although we will get back to that in a minute because I do think I know whose they were. Now, I also believe that Narfi's assassination was likely Wilhelm's doing as well. Again, Wilhelm seems to be tormented by the consequences of his actions. Yes, Raider was killed, which is nasty business by itself, but that's a one-time event. That happened and that's in the past. Whereas Narfi is not in the past, he's in the present. He's in the present every waking moment. And his lamented wailing, searching for his lost sister. Raider, where are you, Raider? And having to watch his sad and mad decline as a daily reminder to Wilhelm of the awful repercussions of his hit on Raider. It's just way too much for him to bear, as would be to any man. Again, as we see with the line he delivers when we show him Raider's necklace. Raider, you saw Raider. Did you tell her Narfi cries? Did you tell her Narfi never said goodbye like mother and father? So to put this constant daily mental torture and reminder to rest, Wilhelm also calls a hit on Narfi in the hopes this will finally put his own mind at peace. That is my most likely theory behind the death of Raider and Narfi based on again the evidence available in game, of which there is not much, and that which is there was really, really hard to find. Oh, and remember when Wilhelm says this? Wilhelm, what's the story with Narfi? Ah, uh, he's harmless. He's been in a state ever since his sister Raida disappeared over a year ago. Well, he might just be saying this so that we think that Wilhelm has nothing against Narfi, when in reality it's another one of Wilhelm's ploys to make us think that he is totally innocent, and therefore not even consider him as the one who called for the contract on Narfi. Not that we really would think it was Wilhelm in the first place, just at face value, but if we think about who called the hit on Narfi, the person we don't think of is the guy who said, oh, Narfi, he's harmless. So again, could be nothing or it could be a very clever ploy. Just like when he said that he looked for Raider to make himself seem innocent and helpful. And when he lied about the screams to make us think that Windelius might have done it. This is, of course, assuming that Wilhelm is capable of making uh, these galaxy brain moves. Now, to build upon this, what about the two iron arrows that we find with Raider's corpse? If she were assassinated by the Dark Brotherhood at Wilhelm's request, whose were they? Who actually used these arrows to kill Raider? Well, seemingly a tough question, because when we think of the Dark Brotherhood, if you're like me, 
You probably associate them with a sneaky character who stands in the shadows and uses a bow to snipe down targets from a distance and then never gets caught. That's a pretty common trope and a pretty common playstyle. However, despite this trope and stereotype, there is only one Dark Brotherhood member in the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim who uses a bow. And that would be this lovely young lady, Gabriella. She is the only Dark Brotherhood member who uses a bow. Along with this, during the Dark Brotherhood quest called Bound Until Death, in which we must assassinate Vittoria Vici at her wedding, Gabriella will say this when asked if she has any advice on the contract. I hope you don't mind, but I took the liberty of surveying the site of the reception. There's a small parapet just opposite the balcony that would prove an excellent spot for a long-range kill. I left something there for you, if you're inclined to take that approach. So it turns out that Gabriella has actually scouted the place out before us and has left a unique bow called Firinial's End up here in a perfect spot to loose an arrow and do the deed. Firstly, this just furthers her love of bows and sniping her targets from a distance, but it proves something else, Gabriella's prowess to go unnoticed. You see, this wedding takes place in the courtyard of the Temple of the Divines, which is attached to Castle Dower, which is the Grand Fortress of Solitude, Skyrim's capital, and acts as the headquarters of the Imperial Legion and is supposed to be the residence of the Emperor when he visits Skyrim. Point being, it's the most heavily fortified, the most heavily populated, and the most highly guarded location in Skyrim. Yet Gabriella, just as a little favor, snuck straight in here unnoticed just to place a bow that we may or may not even use. This just proves that she has immaculate skills in remaining hidden. So I mean, if she can sneak past a billion guards and the Imperial Legion in their own base, then those two guards in Ivar's stead who patrol the bridge would have been a joke to her. So purely on a sneaking level, Gabriella has most certainly proven that she could have easily killed Raider and remained completely unnoticed, and made sure that no one noticed Raider's death. But that is not all, get this. While yes, she uses a bow, guess what kind of arrows she uses? Iron arrows. Yes, that is correct. She actually has the exact same arrows that we've been trying so hard to track down. Not only does she have the right arrows, but she could have also killed Raider simply by stabbing her with the arrows. While I find this unlikely, when we first meet Gabriella, we can ask her to tell us about herself, upon which she says this. What a curious question. Well, I enjoy moonlit nights, taking long walks on the beach, knitting, and unicorns. In fact, I once took a seaside stroll on a moonlit night and discovered a unicorn, which I proceeded to stab in the throat with a crochet needle. I'm a woman of refined yet simple tastes. Now, if we are to take this tale as true, that Gabriella killed a unicorn by stabbing it in the neck with a crochet needle, then we know for a fact that Gabriella could most certainly have killed Raider by stabbing her with iron arrows. I personally don't know why one would choose to do that when a bow was an option, but it is a possibility. So I thought worth mentioning. Oh, and yes, that is not all either, as when you're doing the Dark Brotherhood quest, the recipe for disaster, if we ask Gabriella if she has any advice for us on how to secretly kill the Gourmet, she will say this. You've been directed to dispose of the Gourmet's body, is that correct? I often find water to be a suitable hiding place. A lake, a pool, me, the sea. Hmm, splash splash, a body in water, does that remind us of anything? Hmm. So, Gabriella is the only Dark Brotherhood member to use a bow along with being the only Dark Brotherhood member to use or carry iron arrows, the exact same ones we've been looking for, she also has been proven to have the sneaking skills of Rajin, the Khajiiti thief god, and she likes to hide the bodies of her victims in water, like a lake. And a lake is exactly where we find Raider's corpse, 
with exactly the same projectile that Gabriella uses to kill people, the Iron Arrows. So boom, there you go. There's my ultimate theory about Raider and Nafi. Wilhelm called the hit on Raider because he thought she was a witch. He hates magic users. He has a book on killing witches. He has the Dark Brotherhood contacts as his inn is literally a meeting place for them and their clients. He has the money to pay for an assassination or two or three, which he has acquired from selling ancient Nordic items at Bercy's shop. And he has the gems and the gold and the jewelry and whatever else Lindley Starsung is paying for his protection with. And he's also not adverse to doing things under the table, doing sneaky, illegal things. So Wilhelm whispers in the right ears, pays the gold, and the contract is set. Then the assassin that accepts the contract was Gabriella of the Dark Brotherhood, who waits until Raider is crossing the river, then kills her silently with her bow and iron arrows. Raider's death has haunted Wilhelm because of Narfi's constant torment. So Wilhelm called the hit on Narfi as well in an attempt to get some peace of mind and finally forget the whole thing. And you might be asking, why didn't Wilhelm call the hit on Nafi straight after Raider's thing? Because Nafi's decline into madness was slow and gradual. He didn't think he needed to take out Nafi. Only after a year or so of constant mental torment did Wilhelm feel like he had to act. And he did already try to act with words because he told Nafi that Raider was going to come back and everything was going to be okay in an attempt to make him settle down and stop tormenting Wilhelm with his constant pleas and cries for his sister Raider. So this, what I have just presented to you, is the most plausible series of events that I can think of that actually have tangible in-game evidence and puzzle pieces that fit together to quite soundly create a full picture. So that is what I believe happened. It makes the most sense out of all the theories that we've looked at and all the theories that we could think of and all the theories that other people could think of. But that's not all. There are still a couple of chapters in this story. Before we get onto those though, just a little bonus in regards to Gabriella and her aptitude for hiding bodies in water. Curiously, within the city of Whiterun, beneath the wooden bridge that leads to Dragon's Reach, we can actually find a skeleton in the water. Who it belonged to is unknown. Along with this, within the city of Markarth, just next to the smithy in the pool of water beneath the waterfall, we can also find another skeleton hidden in the water. Could these be more victims of Gabriella? People she killed and then hid in plain sight by executing her signature move of hiding her prey under water. Could be. Food for thoughts, or water for thoughts in this case. Now, before we get onto the final string of Daedric Madness, there is one thing we just spoke about that I would like to address. As, like me, you might have begun to formulate a theory, but I would like to assure you that it's not the smoking gun we think it could be. As mentioned, inside the Blackbriar Manor in Riften, there are the remains of the Black Sacrament ritual, with a note addressed to Astrid from Maven. Meaning, of course, that Maven Blackbriar was the one who undertook the ceremony, aka she wants someone dead. But the question is, of course, who? Who did she want dead? Well, her son Sibby Blackbriar is in prison because he killed the brother of his former fiancé, Svidi, who we now know is actually Lindley Starsung, who is in hiding. Now, could it be that Maven performs the Black Sacrament ritual because she wanted Sviddy slash Linley dead? It is possible, while yes, Sibby Blackbriar is 100% in the wrong, Maven is his mother and the Blackbriar family is essentially the Mafia. If you cross them in any regard, you can expect the worst possible outcome. Here is the thing though. If this is true, my thinking was that the Dark Brotherhood may have assassinated Raider by accident. You see, Sibi Blackbriar describes Svidi, Linley Starsung, as having flowing black hair. She was a young woman, buxom with long flowing black hair. And while in my game here, I have many mods and her hair is also black, which makes sense, but in the vanilla game, in a completely unmodded Skyrim, Linley Starsung has light blonde hair, likely as a disguise to make her less recognizable. 
So, what if Maven's instructions were to kill Spitty, who is hiding in Ivarstead and has black hair? Well, the Dark Brotherhood assassin would get this information, head to Ivarstead, and what do they find in Ivarstead? They find one woman with black hair, but it ain't Spitty slash Linley because in the base game, she's got blonde hair. So who does have black hair? Well, it would have been Raider. Now we don't know for sure that Raider had black hair, but her brother Nafi does. So it would be within reason to assume, you know, with genetics and all, that Raider would have the same hair color as her brother. And as great as this theory is, sadly, it falls apart once again with the timeline, as Sibby Blackbriar is serving a jail sentence of eight months. And he's still locked up, so we know for a fact that he has been in that prison for less than eight months. From that, we know that Sibi killed Sfidi's brother less than eight months ago. That's why he's in prison. But we also know for a fact that Raider died over a year ago. So unfortunately, as cool and as sound as this theory was, it just quite literally does not fit in the timeline and is 100% not possible. So this black sacrament that Maven Blackbriar performed and its unknown targets still remain a mystery. All we do know is it wasn't the death of Raider. Ah, now as promised, if you've lasted this long, you deserve this little treat at the end. This is the dessert of the meal. We have a rather weird road that we are going to keenly and carefully wander down. This is miffingly intriguing, but also it's only like 50% of the way to making any sense. So take everything with a big old pinch of fire salts, as I don't really know what to take away from any of this information or how to use any of this information, but all of this stuff is way too odd not to mention. And again, this video is for you. I want to tell you everything I can, so maybe you can figure out what's going on here and how, slash if, any of it ties into Raider and Nafi's story. So as implied earlier, I am rather certain I know where Raider got her training and knowledge of the alchemical arts from. As if we visit Mistvale Keep, the seat of Yarlayla Lawgiver of Riften, we can run into the rather bewildered, puzzled, and spacey court wizard, a Bosma woman named Willandria. If we speak with her, we'll get a pretty good idea that something is kind of off. She's lovely and all, but she's a wacky character. And she's most certainly off with the pixies. You know, she's got a head in the clouds kind of vibe. Hello there. Did we have an appointment? No. It was a delivery? I can't remember. Excuse my disorganization, but I'm in the middle of some delicate experiments. What's got you so preoccupied? Someone actually interested in what I'm doing. Amazing! Well, allow me to explain. My experimentation involves a magical construct and a reagent that will allow the construct to maintain a field of permanent harmonic energy. I didn't understand a word of that. You don't have to because it's utter nonsense. It's never going to work. No, no, no. What I need to do is reverse that, draw the harmonic energy into the reagent, and then apply it with the proper incantation. What was I thinking? It would never work that first way. Why didn't you tell me? How about using calipers? Calipers? That's utterly ridiculous. Maybe long ago you could just find calipers in every household across Tamriel, but not anymore. Hold on. You've given me a brilliant idea. Just as calipers hold materials in place, a soul siphon can hold magic fields in place. Genius! And I'm sure you've completely worked out how to counteract complete dimensional collapse, right? Swallow a soul gem? Are you completely insane? Swallow a soul gem? That has to be the most brilliant and unexpected solution I've heard in a long time. It solves all of my problems and keeps the field stable. Now all I need... Wait, what were we talking about? You appear to need help getting organized. Yes, I could use some help with that. An assistant, perhaps? No, no, no. Maybe a familiar... No, too messy. Well, at any rate, organization is not my strong suit. Not at all. I need as much help as I can get. In fact, 
If you could retrieve a few things for me, I could start on my next set of experiments. Alright, what did you need me to get? As you can imagine, I tend to forget things often. Leave things around. I really must learn to put these things away. What I need is my Dwemer Stirring Spoon, my Orichalcum Ingot, and my Grand Soul Gem. In fact, I could use them immediately. Bring those items back to me, and I'll be happy to experiment on you. N no, no, that isn't right. I'd be happy to reward you. Point the way, and I'll go get them. Excellent. I can't wait. Well, why are you still standing here? Oh, right. You need to know where they are. That would help. Yes. Um, where exactly am I going? Let's see. Last time I used the Dwemer Spoon was at my dear friend Bodhi's house in Iverstead. Fellstar Farm, I believe it's called. The Orichalcum Ingot should still be at Winterhold at the Frozen Hearth Inn. I don't know why I didn't just take it with me. And last is the Soul Gem. I left that one in Windhelm at the White File Alchemy Shop. It was a good trade, too. Oh well. She is big is. Okay. Now where did I put those spiders? So as we can see, Willandria is quite spacey. She's brilliant, but spacey. She's not quite entirely in the room at any given time. And there is an explanation for this, however, which was actually hinted at with one of the dialogue options that we just saw, but we'll get back to that in a minute. As to understand why she's a bit loopy, we'll have to take a peek on the shelf under her shop front, where we can find a piece of paper. This is a letter from the College of Winterhold to Willandria, titled Per Your Request, which reads, Willandria, your letter sent to the College of Winterhold was rife with grammatical errors and incomplete thoughts making them difficult to discern. Could you please clarify the points below for us to ensure we're on the same page? We have no record of a cloud emulsifier, device, or anything involving the magical manipulation of the clouds. Second, we can't send you a sample of the Heart of Lorcan for experimentation, as no such sample exists. And finally, in the 14th paragraph of your letter, you mention a substance called green motes. We're assuming this was a simple mistake, and you meant to write green spore. If that is the case, we have contaminated Skeever carcasses with the disease available if needed. We would also like to thank you for sending us your notes regarding your experiments. We've all had quite a grand time reading them. Signed, Mirabel Irvine. Now this letter is rather interesting as the ingredient slash substance that Willandria had requested from the College of Winterhold was Green Moat. Now, if you've played the Elder Scrolls for Oblivion expansion, The Shivering Isles, you might be familiar with it. However, there is a very important distinction to make. Unrefined Green Moat is called just that. In game, it is called Unrefined Green Moat, and it is a fairly common alchemy ingredient within the Shivering Isles, which is of course the Plane of Oblivion belonging to Sheogorath. Now, this unrefined green moat can be harvested from mushroom trees. A lame name, I know, but that is their actual in-law name, mushroom trees. Anyway, unrefined green moat is all well and good. It's easily found within the Plain of Oblivion, the Shivering Isles. Refined green moat, which is simply known and called green moat, is very rare indeed. It can only be found in a hidden silo beneath the new Sheoth Palace, which is the citadel that holds the seat of the Daedric Prince of Madness, Sheogorath. And here, in this hidden silo, through an unknown alchemical process, the rather boring unrefined green moat is refined into green moat which is a very powerful psychotropic substance known to exist only by a handful of people and consumed by even fewer. So green moat is an extremely secretive substance and only found within the highest echelons within the plain of oblivion, the Shivering Isles, which raises the question, how the hell 
campus where Landria know about green moats. She requested it from the College of Winterhold, who, let's not forget, have no idea what she's talking about. They've never heard of green moats. Let's allow that to sink in. Not a single person at the College of Winterhold, which is one of the oldest and most well-established arcane institutions in Tamriel, not a single person here knows what green moat is. That's how secretive and alien this substance is. Yet, the court wizard of Riften knows about it? How? How does Willandria know what green moat is? You can only ask for it if you know what it is. Well, because of this, there is only one explanation. At the very least, Willandria has been to the Shivering Isles and has sat at the high table of the Court of Mania in the New Sheoth Palace within the Shivering Isles, the only place where they consume green moats. It is the only way that she could have any knowledge of this hidden Daedric delicacy. And her apparent associations with the Shivering Isles and therefore Sheogorath explain her eccentricity and for a lack of a better phrase, her madness. Taking this point further, during dialogue, one of our speech options is how about using calipers? This is actually also a reference to the Shivering Isles expansion for the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, as there are no calipers within the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. Calipers? That's utterly ridiculous. Maybe long ago you could just find calipers in every household across Tamriel, but not anymore. However, within the Shivering Isles, the Nord Tove the Unrestful has the player character collect as many calipers as they can, i.e. potentially all of the calipers in the game. Anyway, you're going to help me find calipers and tongs. The world is devoid of calipers and tongs. What a sad state of affairs. This seems to be the apparent reason to why there are no more calipers within Tamriel at the time of the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. So this dialogue option and Willandria's following dialogue are again referencing the Shivering Isles, furthering her evident familiarity with the Plain of Oblivion, the Shivering Isles, and this exceptionally rare and inimitable narcotic green moat. So we have a court wizard, who's been in the Shivering Isles and rubbed shoulders with the highest classes there. Okay, cool, what does that actually mean? Well, Willandria isn't only good at being a strange and scattered woman, she is also brilliant in the art of alchemy. Despite her often talking about her experiments, which seem to be some strange mixture of enchanting and tonal magics, her shopfront, room and laboratory only contain vast amounts of alchemy-related paraphernalia. There is an alchemy table. She has shelves brimming with rare ingredients, potions lining the bar top. So it's clear that Willandria is a master of alchemy, which makes me wonder if she once served as the secret grand alchemist who worked in the silo below the new Sheoth Palace and turned unrefined green moats into green moats. I mean, she's got the credentials, she's definitely been there, she knows what green moat is, so it's definitely an interesting thought. Now, these alchemy skills of hers are important, as do you remember who she said her best friend was? Boti. Hear it again. Last time I used the Dwemer's Spoon was at my dear friend Bodhi's house in Iverstead. Felstar Farm, I believe it's called. So Willandry's best friend is Boti, who lives at Felstar Farm in Ivarstead, along with her husband, Jofthor, and her daughter, Fastrid, who all live just across from where Narfi lives and where Raider likely used to live. Although Raider may have lived at the Villamere Inn, as we established earlier. But that's also fine. I mean, the town of Ivarstead is so small that who lives where, who sleeps where, who stays where when they visit, it doesn't really matter. Although, I would imagine that when Willandria visits her best friend Boti in Ivarstead, she stays at the Villamere Inn as well. It's the only place with spare beds. Now, that's an interesting thought. Because, as I mentioned before, Wilhelm owns one book, and that is Herbane's Bestiary, Hagravens. But in the guest room of Vilamir Inn, there are two books, one of which is the Wabajak. So, hmm, something else related to Sheogorath. 
It seems that the Bosma daughter of the Shivering Isles has been leaving her things all over the place. So we've got Willandria, a master alchemist and patron of Sheogorath, visiting Ivarstead, which was home to Raida, daughter of farmers, yet somehow a prolific alchemist. As we've again already established by the quality and rarity of her alchemy ingredients. So if we put two and two together, we can surmise that Willandria was likely the one who taught Raider what she knows about alchemy. But what if it wasn't just alchemy that she was passing on? What if Willandria was intentionally or perhaps even unintentionally spreading the maddening roots of Sheogorath to her student, Raider? and a student's hometown, Ivarstead. Well, again, take all of this with a big pinch of fire salts, because I'm not too sure what's happening, if anything, but there sure are some weird coincidences around this village. So at Fellstar Farm, where Boaty, Willandria's best friend, lives on the ground, there is a wedge of cheese for no apparent reason. Now, I'm not going to say that all cheese is connected to Sheogorath. That's just rather ironically mad. But the farm of a highly likely Sheogorath worshipping wizard's best friend having cheese on the ground for no reason, it's a bit weird. I also checked within the creation kit and this cheese is sitting here. So it hasn't fallen off of something. This piece of cheese was placed on the ground on purpose by one of the developers. And let us not forget that one of Sheogorath's titles is the Cheese Prince. Again, I wouldn't go to court with this piece of cheese as evidence of Sheogorath's influence over Ivarstead, but it is definitely strange. Strange enough that it's grabbed my attention. Now, do you know what else is associated with Sheogorath? Butterflies. If you've played Oblivion and its DLCs, I'm sure you know that when you enter the Shivering Isles for the first time and meet with Haskill, the room eventually fades beautifully into a fluttering kaleidoscope of butterflies. But the reason for this is much darker than one might suspect. While Sheogorath is often considered goofy, funny, random, or quirky by the average Elder Scrolls player, he is, in fact, an unhinged maniac, quite possibly the most cruel and violent Daedric Prince of them all. As his favorite pastime is torture, he spent the first three to four thousand years of his existence tormenting, torturing, and mutilating butterflies. As he himself says when we encounter him as the Skooma Cat in Elsewhere within the Elder Scrolls Online. Chasing butterflies now, plaything. Ah, to be young again. I must have spent my first three or four thousand years terrorizing those colorful little cooties. Alas, I'm a grown man, cat god. With grown mad cat god tastes to get back to. Now get! What self-respecting person goes around chasing butterflies with a net? Everybody knows you use a hammer. In an ironic and sadistic twist, Butterflies are now associated with Sheogorath, serving as a sign of his influence. With this in mind, remember the abandoned alchemist shack we spoke of earlier, the one Raider almost certainly used? Well, guess what can be found outside? That's right, butterflies. Now, don't worry, much like the cheese on the ground, I'm not going to say that everywhere with a butterfly has been influenced or visited by Sheogorath. However, there is something much stranger. As you probably know, throughout Skyrim, there are five unique bugs in jars. These are just collectibles that serve no purpose other than just being cool. They are actually part of a cut quest, as they have runes under their lids that naturally spawned an endless slew of fan theories. However, I did speak to one of Skyrim's developers, more specifically the developer who was in charge of these bugs in jars, and he confirmed that these bugs in jars are nothing beyond just part of a half-baked idea that never fully formed during development. 
serpents. Anyway, there is a bee in a jar, there is a butterfly in a jar, there is a dragonfly in a jar, there is a moth in a jar, and a torch bug in a jar. Now guess what? Within this abandoned alchemist's shack, a location of quite some significance in this video which now has Shield Gorath in our minds, well what can we find here? Hmm, we can find the one and the only butterfly in a jar. Don't forget, it's the only one in the game. It's here in this shack that Raider likely frequented, who was likely trained by Willandria, who is an acolyte of Shilgorath. And butterflies are associated with Shilgorath and his influence. And the only one in the game that can be found in a jar just so happens to be here. Which I must say, keeping a pet butterfly in a jar sure does seem like something that someone who dabbles in the worship of Shilgorath would want to do. They would want to have that around. You know, something like uh, Christians having a crucifix on the wall, or Hindus having a statue of Vishnu, or someone who bows down to the mad daddy Shilgorath would want something that represents him around, like a butterfly in a jar. I mean, I like Todd Howard, and I've got a tiny version of him in a jar, so this does make sense. But hey, maybe that's just me. Again, I don't know if this is a coincidence. I don't know if this means nothing. I don't know if this is the most important plot point. And it is impossible to say which it is, but I do know that it's pretty suspicious. Now, along with this, there is only one farm in Ivarstead, which is run by Joff Thor and his daughter Fastrid and his wife Boti, the best friend of Willandria, the Riften Cord Wizard, who clearly has an association with Shulgorath. Now, the name of their farm has begun to bother me. We're in the middle of nowhere in a little rural town, and the farm isn't called Pumpkin Patch Farm or the Green Bean Farmstead or anything like that. It's called Fell Star Farm. Fell Star. Strange name for a farm, no? What does that mean? Fell Star? A star that fell? Like a shooting star? Well, in the Elder Scrolls universe, falling stars are actually fragments of Ethereus. You might be more familiar with them by their other names, such as Vala Stones, Welkin Stones, Sky Shards, Meteoric Glass, the Star Teeth, Vaka Stones, Melondo Stones, Magna Geodes, Kulunda Stones, the Stormhold Crystal, or the Jewel of Fire, or any of the various unnamed fragments found within the Sigig Vault, or any of the other ethereal fragments that I have forgotten. Now, despite that list being rather extensive, none of the aforementioned ethereal fragments have any connection or relevance to this farm, as far as I can tell anyway. So maybe this name, Fellstar, isn't referring to a fallen star, but perhaps a fell star, a star that is fell. If you are unaware, the word fell has several meanings, one of which is evil, bad, cruel, savage, wicked, baleful, terrifying, etc, etc, etc. You get the point. That's where fell magic gets its name from in the Warcraft universe. So essentially fell with this definition just means bad, it's not good. So, could Fell Star Farm be referring to Fell in this manner? The bad star, the evil star, the wicked star, the baleful star, the terrifying star, the cruel star, the savage star? If so, well, what the hell does that mean? Well, interestingly, as we touched on earlier, stars within the Elder Scrolls universe are not what we know as stars at all. They are actually holds and what we see shining through is light from Ethereus. That's why fallen stars are actually ethereal fragments, pieces of Ethereus that have fallen through one of these holes, through the firmament and into the mortal plane, Mundus. So with this knowledge, it would seem that no star is more evil than any other star. They're all just holes, right? And yeah, that is correct. But there are many deities and gods and heroes and stuff like that within the Elder Scrolls who go by more than one name. In fact, many of the deities have tens of names. And guess what? There is one deity that I can find that has a name that they go by that involves the word star. And that deity is actually a Daedric Prince. And that Daedric Prince is Sheogorath, as one of his titles is actually the Mad Star. Shilgorath could be conceived as evil, chaotic, bad, savage, wicked, baleful, terrifying, 
all the things that the word fell means. So could it be that Uncle Shio is the fell star that the farm is named after? I mean, madness is considered a bad thing. You've got fell meaning bad, and then mad meaning bad. The mad star, could this be the fell star? Well, to be honest, I am not sure. But it is food for thoughts. And to add some even stranger spices to this insane stew, while researching green mode, I found myself scouring the Imperial Library, as any responsible detective would do. And given green mode's rarity, the results were most certainly slim. However, I stumbled across this note which is found within the Elder Scrolls Online, specifically within the Arcane Library beneath the Wizard's Tower, Tor Driok, which can be found on High Isle. It's titled The Purities of Mania and is written by an unknown author, and reads as follows. I will not sign my name to this treatise, no, 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 no. But I am compelled to write down the wonders I have seen and felt in my time in the Shivering Isles. The mania that overtook me was an open moor I both feared and was drawn to. A whirlwind of madness from which creativity, sleeplessness, fury, and joy burst forth. I explored for a period of time that I cannot remember, a year, a month, I do not know for certain, wherein I dove into the secrets of a spell, while my understanding was enhanced and expanded using green moat. I walked away from this experience with the key to unlocking the mysteries of the rare crystals sometimes found among alien ruins. You may laugh with disbelief when I tell you that I delved into the heart of an amethyst crystal created by some ancient alien, perhaps, which had been fasted and formed by the winds of mania. Let me explain and you shall see the truth of it the clear and brilliant all-consuming truth. Okay, so this is once again suspiciously coincidental. You see, the aliens believed starlight to be the purest form of magic. Hence, they gathered, harnessed, and manipulated the power of these ethereal fragments. The most common among them are the Welkin Stones and Dvala Stones. The very same ones that we just spoke about due to the out-of-place name of Fell Star Farm. And to unlock the mysteries of these crystals or stars that fell, this unknown author enhanced their cognition and vision with the exceptionally exclusive Daedric substance, Green Moat. Green Moat, that extremely rare and secret psychotropic delicacy that Willandria not only magically knows about, but also requests from the College of Winterhold. And Willandria's best friend Boti, a random farmer, lives at the oddly named Fellstar Farm. Now, as mentioned, there are only six written accounts of Green Moat within the Elder Scrolls universe, two of which are about the Prophet Arden's soul, so these are basically mythology, two of which are using a Green Moat experience as a descriptor when talking about another experience, which can be found in the Pocket Guide, and the other two are Willandria's letter to the College of Winterhold, and this one, The Purities of Madness. So the only two where they're actually talking about green moat, in a modern day, hey, I'm here right now and I want some green moat, or used some green moat, being this letter, The Purities of Madness, and Willandria's letter to the College, and what's mentioned? Well, green moat is mentioned in both, obviously. Alien crystals, which are ethereal fragments, which are fallen stars, stars that fell, and Willandria, who has the other letter, is best friends with Boti, who lives at Fell Star Farm. Does that mean Willandria wanted Green Moat so she could unlock the mysteries of Fell Star Farm? Uh, maybe. What mysteries? Are there mysteries here? Ah, look, at this point, I feel like I'm the one that's been eating too much Green Moat. Again, I have not a goddamned clue if there is anything valid or plausible actually here but two rather obscure topics that we already just so happen to find ourselves looking at, both showing up in a completely unrelated source material. It's like, I don't know what to do with this information, but it is discomfortingly coincidental, yet again. And it won't be the last time, I'm sure. And it's also worth mentioning that Sfiddy, since she arrived in Ivarstead, has, for whatever reason, taken the name Linley Star Sung. We've got Fellstar, 
Star Sung and the Mad Star Shiogorath, which for a place with no apparent relation to stars, there sure is a strange handful of starry names knocking around. Well, what do we do with this information? I honestly don't know. That's why I'm telling you. Maybe you're smart enough to piece this mess together. Now, while we are on the topic of women and Shiogorath, he does something rather sick, specifically with young women. Young women such as Raida, young women such as Fastridge, and young women such as Lindley Starsung. It is said that Shiogorath invented music as he rips young women asunder. From their tendons, he makes lutes. From their skulls and bones, he makes drums. And from their bones, he makes flutes. He presented these gifts to mortals, and thus music was born. Shiogorath, the Mad Star, Fell Star Farm, Linley Star Sung, the Bard, music, young women like Linley Star Sung, young women like Raider, who is dead, young women like Fastrid, who is the daughter of Boti, the best friend of Willandria, the Shiogorath worshipping Bosma Court Wizard of Riften. Again, I can't quite connect anything in a substantial manner, but there are so many odd semi-connections lulling about Ivarstead and everyone we're looking at in this investigation. Another interesting fact about Shiogorath is his favourite weapon, which is the crossbow. Now while the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim DLC Dawnguard introduced crossbows, in the base game of Skyrim crossbows were not present at all in the game. And along with crossbows not being present in the base game, the crossbow ammunition bolts were also not present. So if for whatever reason, if a developer did want to show that someone had been killed by a crossbow in the base game of Skyrim, they would have to use arrows to tell that story. And what do we find next to Raider's corpse? Arrows. Again, just a thought, but imagine that plot twist. Shilgorath killed Raider with a crossbow. Even stranger still, it is said that when Lorcan's Divine Spark was removed, brought into being, was Shiogorath, who, in this same sentence, is referred to as the Sithis-shaped hole. Now, I have spoken at length about this to several people that I would consider lore experts, or at least very well versed in Elder Scrolls lore. And collectively, or even just one-on-one, -on -one, none of us can really land on a good explanation for what the title of Sithis Shaped Hole actually equates to in a definitive form without getting into fictional metaphor and metaphysics. But again, it's interesting that a mystery cloaked in the Dark Brotherhood, who hails Sithis, now has the shadowy presence of Shilgrath lurking in our minds, who is the Sithis shaped hole. Again, kinda weird. Now to make things even weirder and get more stuff involved, in the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion's DLC The Shivering Isles, during the main questline, if we're on the mission titled Baiting the Trap, we, the player character, are tasked by Shiogorath himself to send a group of greedy treasure hunters mad. There is Lewin the Rogue, Sindelius the Mage, and Gromok the Warrior. Now these three have been up to some mischief, as they have raided and looted a number of dungeons on Tamriel, and after their success they have decided to come to the Shivering Isles in the hopes to plunder ancient dungeons of their wealth. Well, as payment for their intent, we have a variety of ways to make them lose their minds and go insane. A fun and joyful task that pleases the Prince of Madness very much. But, rather interestingly, the Dunmer Mage, his name is Sindelius Gatharian, a dark elf wizard who is a treasure hunter who is sent insane as there's a big pile of treasure, but he cannot find the key to get to that treasure and loses his mind. Is that uh, ringing any bells? Sindelius Gatharian. Dark Elf Wizard said insane because he can't find the key to the treasure. Oh, well remember Windelius Gatharian, the Dark Elf Wizard treasure hunter, who is in Shroudhearth Barrow and who is sent insane because he cannot find the Sapphire Dragon Claw, which is the key to the treasure that he wants. And who is hiding that key from him? Wilhelm. 
as Wilhelm had it the whole time. So is the Gatharian bloodline cursed to be sent insane as treasure hunters who can't find the key to the treasure? Or is it all some trick and Wilhelm is knowingly or even unknowingly doing Shilgarath's bidding? Or is this just another really strange coincidence? Well, I am not sure, but once again, Shilgorath appears to be rearing his smirking head in Ivarstead, time and time again. I mean, Windilius not only went mad, but he went mad in the exact same way, and for the exact same reasons that his descendant went mad, who went mad at the request of Shilgorath within the Shivering Isles. I mean, uh, coincidence? Sure, possible coincidence. But also, it's pretty goddamn weird and so specifically Shilgorath related. Now, despite Ivarstead being below High Hrothgar, the home of the Greybeards, masters of the Thum, the way of the voice, most of the town's inhabitants don't really know what they do. They just know there's a monastery up there. They don't really know what's happening. When we ask Boti about High Hrothgar, she will say this. Well, it's, it's frightening now. living below their monastery. Sometimes I swear I can hear strange noises rolling down from up there. It sounds like thunder, but there's never any rain. What do you make of that? Now, of course, we know these thunderous noises to be shouts. However, she does not seem to know what the source of this thunder is. To make this even more curious is that in Elder Scrolls lore, thunderstorms are to be avoided, as they are said to belong to... You guessed it, Shilgorath. So as far as Boti is aware, there is thunder on the mountain. And let's not forget that Boti's best friend who visits Ivarstead is Willandria, the Riften Court wizard who is most certainly associated with Shilgorath. Now let's just say that Boti was jiving with Shilgorath. Then she would most certainly interpret this thunder as his presence. Interestingly, Gwilin, Timber Wide Arms apprentice, also says this when we ask him about High Hrothgar. I always thought it was odd that there's a layer of thick clouds covering the peak of the mountain above the monastery. Huh, not sure what's up there, but I bet the Greybeards know. Now, of course, we know this thick cloud is actually a spell cloaking the path to Parthenax. But again, from the unknowledgeable locals' point of views, it's just a thick cloud on the mountain with thunder coming from it, again making it even more like a thunderstorm, making it even easier to associate with Shilgorath. And along with this, not only are thunderstorms a sign of Shilgorath's presence, but Shilgorath is actually one of the easiest Daedric Princes to summon. As while he, along with all other Daedric Princes, have a specific summoning day, these being one set date a year in which a particular Daedric Prince may be invoked unto the mortal plane, Mundus, well, the Mad God has a little loophole. Well, it's actually a huge loophole, as Shilgarath can in fact be summoned anytime, regardless of date, provided there is a storm present which we learn from the book titled Wabajack, in which the author summons Shilgrath during a storm on Hermaeus Mora's summoning day, aka not Shilgrath's summoning day. This is interesting as, what is one of only two books found within the Villamir Inn's guest rooms, where a handful of the local townsfolk sleep? That's right, the one we mentioned earlier, nothing other than the book The Wabajack. So, the people of Ivarstead have the knowledge on how to summon Shilgorath at their fingertips, which is knowledge they may be using, or not, who knows, but it's definitely worth mentioning, as it might just explain how and why there is such a heavy air of Shilgorath's influence cloaking the small and initially boring town of Ivarstead. It's also worth noting the distinct frequency of cloudy things around here. There are thunderous clouds atop the throat of the world. Fastrut, Boti's daughter, daydreams all day, and figuratively speaking, her head is in the clouds. Any idea how I can get my daughter's head out of the clouds? Willandria, the court wizard of Riften, also has a scatterbrain and has her head in the clouds, again figuratively. Along with this, in her request to the College of Winterhold, she also asks for a cloud emulsifier, which much like the green moat she asked for, the College of Winterhold had never heard of such 
such a thing. Now, there is no reference to a cloud emulsifier within the Elder Scrolls lore, nor in real life. So we can assume that given the general principles of emulsion, that a cloud emulsifier would be something that could basically capture clouds into liquids. Although, in the letter from the college, it does say, we have no record of a cloud emulsifier device or anything involving the magical manipulation of the clouds. Magical manipulation of the clouds? Why would Belandria want to magically manipulate the clouds? Maybe to create thunderstorms as she pleases? Well, this actually makes sense, as remember what we learnt from the book Wabajack about summoning Sheograth during storms? Yeah, so Willandria wants this device so that she can summon her lord Uncle Shio, the Daedric Prince of Madness, Sheograth, whenever the hell she likes, by creating a storm at her whim. This sure seems to be a very fitting reason for Willandria to request from the College of Winterhold a device that can control the weather, but more specifically a device that can control, capture, and store the clouds, the cloud emulsifier. Now along with this, let's not forget that Nafi also says that Raider lives in the clouds now. Oh Raider, Raider, you live among the clouds now, dear Raider. Along with providing the warning that the mountain will eat us. The mountain will eat you, watch the mountain. The mountain which is crowned by thick thunderous clouds. Now as with all of this Shilgorathian tomfoolery, it's all stuff I have observed, it's all stuff I've kind of pieced together and thought, that's weird, but I don't really know what to do with this information. And as a very spicy cherry on top of this cheesecake, there is something else, and it is to do with Norse mythology actually. You see, in Norse mythology, Loki is the god of mischief, he's the trickster god. Forging, sneaking deals with people, which is almost always in detriment to the poor fools in the end. Despite his chaotic actions, Loki was not inherently good nor evil. His eternal goal was to create chaos. Chaos is a synonym for madness. Now, in the Elder Scrolls, the Daedric Prince Clavicus Vile is often associated with Loki seeming to draw the most influence from this Norse god, as Clavicus Vile is the prince of bargains, known for entering pacts with mortals, oftentimes tricking and deceiving them, hence the apparent influence he has drawn from Loki. However, as stated, Loki's ultimate purpose, his ultimate goal, was to create chaos. Now, chaos is a state of complete disorder, confusion and madness. So in this sense, we can see the parallel between Shilgorath and Loki, as Shilgorath is known for constantly and intentionally creating chaos, which is of course in direct opposition to the Daedric Prince of Order, Jigalag. So again, we can see the chaotic kinship that both Loki and Shilgorath share. Well, with this in mind, did you know that Loki has a son. And what is Loki's son's name, you may ask? Well, Loki's son in Norse mythology, well, his name is Nafi. That's right, the Norse god Loki, creator of chaos and therefore madness, has a son called Nafi. And then we have Shilgorath, a Daedric prince of madness and therefore chaos, whose influence is currently in our line of sight when talking about Ivarstead, a town in which there is a madman who just happens to be called Nafi. Oh, and just a side note, Shilgorath is known for enjoying playing skip rope with people's entrails. But only if you're partial to be inflayed alive and having an angry immortal skip rope with your entrails. Am I gonna have to dangle every answer in front of you like cheese stuffed mice hanging by their entrails? Well, in Norse mythology, Loki was bound to a rock for eternity with the entrails of his son, Nafi. Again, another weird semi-connection. Now, I'm not saying that any of this is connected, but it is annoyingly strange and annoyingly coincidental, do you not think? Nafi, son of Loki. Nafi, son of Shilgorath, perhaps? 
It sounds a bit wacky and I hate the trope of, ooh, there's a mad guy, must have been Shiogorath, but let's go a little deeper if we may. It is known that despite Shiogorath being all jester-like and cheese intrigued and such, his favourite pastime in canon lore is actually torture. Straight away, we begin to think of things like hot poking irons and being flayed and so forth. But torture can be mental too, in fact it is by far the most common form of torture. And it's clear that Narthi is undergoing constant mental torture. He's been twisted into a madman by the mysterious disappearance of his sister. Rather interestingly, it is said that madmen are driven insane by speaking with Shilgorath, who gives them advice and information which is beyond their capacity to know. Now remember how before we even meet Narfi, he says this. Oh Raider, Raider, you live among the clouds now, dear Raider. He drops that line which implies that he knows his sister is dead, but he has no way of knowing that. Or does he? If we take this Shilgora thing into account, could Narfi have been sent insane by Shilgorath telling him information which was beyond Narfi's capacity to know, that being that his sister Raider was dead? One, it would explain why Narfi's insane, and two, it would explain how Narfi knows, or seems to know, that Raider is dead before we've even met him, let alone told him that she's dead. An interesting thought. And along with this, history is littered with stories of worshippers of Shilgorath doing great harm to themselves and others, as well as mortals succumbing to madness thanks to Shilgorath's efforts. It is also known that the mad star Shilgorath likes to send people insane by making them perform seemingly pointless and mundane tasks. Pointless and mundane tasks, just like Narfi mining the mountain for hours every day. Despite not using the stone for anything, he's not rebuilding his home with it, and he's not selling it as he is as poor as a cat's foot. So could this be a process that Shilgorath has cursed Narfi to? Well, it's possible. It's also worth mentioning that the sequencing of Narfi's dialogue is seemingly very random. He does not deliver a coherent story, instead just spitting out sporadic bits and bobs of information mixed with inane babble. This rather strange and nonsensical speech pattern of Narfi's was actually flagged as a bug by the team that does the unofficial patch mod. This bug fix was actually reverted, but we'll get onto that in a minute as it doesn't really have anything to do with this story, but it is humorous. So, the way that Narfi speaks was seen as so odd that it was seen as a bug. Which is fair enough, but I believe this conclusion to be incorrect. As in the book titled The Blessings of Shilgorath, the opening line is, For our Lord Shilgorath, without whom all thought would be linear, and all feeling would be fleeting. Without Shilgorath, all thought would be linear? Well, Narfi's thoughts are most certainly not linear. And interestingly, in Solitude, we can find a Bosma man who goes by the name of Dervinin. He is the former High Priest of Mania, who we actually meet during the Shivering Isles DLC for the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. When we encounter him here in Skyrim, he will say this. A method to your madness, and your madness is the method and the melody. So is Narfi's out of order dialogue and his seemingly pointless rhyming actually the method and melody of madness? Could be, it sure seems to fit the bill. Now as I mentioned a moment ago, Narfi's speech pattern is so odd that it was flagged as a bug by the unofficial patch mod, which rearranged Narfi's voice lines so they make more linear sense. Which I personally disagree with for the reason that we just spoke of, I think Narfi's meant to speak like this. But, here is the funny thing. This patch that cleaned up the order of Narfi's dialogue lines actually had to be reverted and removed so that Narfi's lines went back to their original out of order state. As when they implemented the change where they fixed Narfi's dialogue lines, it caused errors and bugs to such a degree that the unofficial patch mod team undid their work and never touched Narfi's dialogue again. I love the idea that Shilgorath has broken the fourth wall and created madness and chaos in real life. 
a team of modders try to normalize a madman in game and Shilgorath causes chaos in the code as revenge, to such a degree that the modders had to restore Nafi's madness. It's a funny thought indeed. But back to Skyrim. Now before we move on from that book, The Blessings of Shilgorath, there's a couple of other lines I think we should look at. Blessed are the madmen, for they hold the keys to secret knowledge. Well, Nafi is a madman, and it's possible that Shilgorath told him some secret knowledge, that being that his sister is dead, and that is what sent him mad. So he's a madman, and he potentially has secret knowledge. Blessed are the phobic, always wary of that which would do them harm. Nafi is phobic, he's scared of the mountain, and when we go to assassinate him for the Dark Brotherhood quest, when we talk to him, even if we choose the remain silent option, he is phobic. He is wary of that which may harm him, he runs away, he cowers in fear. Blessed are the obsessed, for their courses are clear. Nafi is obsessed, he is obsessed with finding his sister Rada. Blessed are the addicts, may they quench the thirst that never ebbs. Well, I would call Nafi an addict. The way he speaks, he always sounds drunk, and he's always drinking mead. I'll live to drink another day. Then down here we have blessed are the sleepless, as they bask in wakeful dreaming. Well, when we tell Nafi that his sister's dead, he says this. Nafi's sad now, still wait for Rada. No more sleep, no, no, no. So Nafi is now sleepless. And the last one that I think has any relevance to Nafi is Blessed Other Paranoid, Ever Watchful for Our Enemies. Which much like the phobic thing you could work into him being scared of us when we just remain silent or him saying, watch the mountain, the mountain will eat you. The mountain will eat you, watch the mountain. And if the avalanche theory is correct, and that crushed his house and killed his parents, then, you know, the mountain would be his enemy, which would also explain potentially why he mines the mountainside. Because it is his enemy. So I thought those similarities were quite interesting. Now, these folk who have been afflicted with madness by Uncle Shio are said to be touched by Shiogorath, or Shiogorath kissed. So is Nafi Shilgorath kissed? Was he sent mad by something Shilgorath told him? Does he speak in such a way and perform inane tasks as a torturous curse from Shilgorath? I honestly cannot say with certainty, but there sure seems to be a suspicious cheese trail littered around Ivarstead. And in the case of Felstar Farm, that is quite literal, but maybe it's nothing. Maybe I am as mad as the Mad God himself at the end of all of this. Hmm, cheese anyone? So, here we are at the end. I have presented absolutely every theory I could conjure for this mystery. My running theory is that Wilhelm feared Rada to be a witch, which she very much seems to have been to some degree. This was a problem for Wilhelm as he despises magic users. With the spiderweb of connections that he has gained by being an innkeeper, he asked one of the Dark Brotherhood members that meet at his inn to kill Raider. He could afford this because of the money he has gained from housing Linley Starsung in hiding and selling artifacts stolen from Shroud Half Barrow at the Pawned Prawn via his best friend, Bercy. The Dark Brotherhood member that did the deed was Gabriella, who uses a bow, uses iron arrows, and likes to hide corpses in bodies of water. That's why we find Raider in the lake with arrows next to a skeleton. Then, over the next year, Nafi's descent into madness, paired with his incessant and harrowing cries for his missing sister Raider, ate at Wilhelm, to the point in which Wilhelm called for a Dark Brotherhood assassination on Nafi as well, just in an attempt at some mental peace, to finally put that to rest. I also believe it is most likely that Willandria, Riften's court wizard, did in fact teach Raider the ways of alchemy. Whether or not Shilgorath was involved, well, that remains at the very least an extremely suspicious road filled with uncanny coincidences. But what I am very interested in is to hear what you think about all of this. There is a hell of a lot of information, and almost all of it is interpretable in one sense or another, making it very difficult to land on a definitive explanation for the death of Raider and the assassination of Nafi. 
So what do you think happens? Or are we too deep in search of answers? Have we fallen into madness? Who can say? But I will dare to ask you, who wanted Nafi killed and why? An evidently harmless beggar who has lost everything. Why would someone spend 750 septums to have him assassinated? What could he have done? Was it the debt that he mentions? Maybe he was caught stealing and the townsfolk got sick of it. Was his assassination a mercy kill of some kind? Or was it for someone else's peace of mind like Wilhelm? Or was Nafi the one that killed Raider along with his parents? If so, how did he do it and why did he do it? I don't think he did, but then why does he say that Raider lives in the clouds now before he even knows that she's dead? Was it secret knowledge that Shiel Gorath told him that sent him crazy? And why does he warn us to watch the mountain? Was it an avalanche that ruined his family home? Was it an avalanche that killed his family? And why does he mine the mountainside? Is it catharsis in revenge for his family? Or is it a curse of mundanity from the Mad God? Why does Klimek stand and stare at Nafi for eight hours every day? Is it meant to be fishing? Or is it out of hatred for the beggar? Why does Jofthor have a script to check if Nafi is dead? What were the bigger plans that the devs had for this? Why does Nafi have access to all of the rarest ingredients in the game, including the illegal ones? Were they raiders or is something else going on here? Was Nafi truly sent mad by the disappearance of his sister? Or has he been Shiogorath kissed? And why is all of his dialogue so muddled and so out of order that it was considered a bug? Is he just another muttering fool or is he the perfect creation of the mad star Uncle Shio? And let us not forget his sister Raider, of course. How did she die? Was she killed where she is found or was she moved there? Was the cart behind the inn used to dump her body? Don't forget about the direction of the water current. She had to have entered the water within the green zone. Why did no one notice her corpse here? Why did no one notice the splashing in the water as she fell in? Almost as if she was killed by a professional assassin. Maybe there is no evil and she accidentally died or did she take her own life? Maybe she faked her death and ran away. And why did a dev place two iron arrows next to her corpse? To indicate that she was killed this way or to draw the player's attention to the spot? Or were they from Shiogorath's crossbow? Or maybe something even more bizarre that we cannot conceive? And who or what killed Raider? Was it the troll nearby the town that had been attacking people? Is that what got her? A frostbite spider, bear or wolf perhaps? Maybe it was the local bandits. They do use iron arrows, but all of her loot was still on her. So that doesn't make much sense. And speaking of her jewelry, why was her necklace in her bag? One tends to wear necklaces around, you know, their neck, not within their bag. It's called a necklace, not a bag lace. Maybe her death was a simple hunting accident, but then why shoot her twice? And then who called the hit on Nafi? Or maybe it was the vampire. No, as fun as it would have been, we do know it wasn't the vampire Venaris Vulpin. And was the abandoned alchemist's shack Raider's Haunt? If not, then what did she use her ingredients for? Strange rituals and spells for the witch coven, perhaps? Did she take the fish as an offering to the hag ravens? If not, then where did they come from? How did they get to this spot? And where did all of this blood come from? Hmm, fishy. Or perhaps it was Windelius that had something to do with Raider's death. He was in town at the right time, and Wilhelm did say that he heard screams. But Windelius didn't mention this in his journal when he mentioned literally everything else. So was Wilhelm lying to distance himself from Raider's death? Or were there truly screams in the night? And what made Windelius go insane and think he was in the first era and the guardian of Shroudhearth Barrow? An effect of the phantom filter he concocted? Or was it the torture of not being able to find the sapphire dragon claw? Maybe the workings of Shiogorath once again, or perhaps some ancient unknown witchcraft was afoot. And was Windelius' family named Gatharian cursed to eternally be sent mad by Shiogorath? Particularly because they are treasure hunters who can't find their keys? That's a pretty suspicious coincidence. And how the hell did Wilhelm get his hands on the Sapphire Dragon Claw? Did he have it the whole time? Or was he working with Raider to get it? And why did he not give it or even sell it to Windelius? Which then begs the question, 
why did he just give it to us? Was it so we could clear the tomb of danger for him? And why are there two iron arrows next to Wilhelm's letter to Bercy? Are these puns by the devs to follow the arrows? As the arrows will lead the way to the truth? Who knows? And who exactly was the victim of Shroud Half Barrow Wilhelm spoke of? Was it Windelius or Raider or someone else? And why is Wilhelm the only innkeeper in the game to carry gemstones? Is this payment for him keeping Lindley Starsung hiding in plain sight? Or was it Wilhelm that killed Raider all along? Or did he call for her assassination? He did have the money, the means, and the motive, and the connections, with his hatred of magic users along with the one book that he owns being based on how to kill witches and hagravens. And when we show him Raider's necklace, he repeats Nafi's dialogue like he's being tortured by guilt. His inn is a Dark Brotherhood meeting place, so he has the connections. So did he call a hit on Raider? And did he call a hit on Nafi too? And was it Gabriella that killed Raider? She does have the sneaking abilities, and she is the only one to use a bow in the Dark Brotherhood, and just so happens to use iron arrows, along with favoring hiding bodies of her victims in water, just like where we find Raider. And what of the court wizard of Riften, Willandria? Is she an acolyte of Sheogorath? How does she know what green mode is? Or was she perhaps at one point the master alchemist behind the sacred substance green mode? Was she the one who taught Raider the art of alchemy? She most certainly visited Ivaster to see her best friend Boti. And why would a seemingly profound court wizard, who has evidently spent time in the Shivering Isles, be best friends with Boti? And did she want the green moat to potentially unlock the mysteries of Fellstar Farm? Just as the unknown author in the note The Purities of Mania used green moat to unlock the secrets of the alien crystals, which are fallen stars, ethereal fragments, Fellstar. Was Willandria up to something else? And is the only butterfly in a jar in the game being located at the alchemy shack Raider used a coincidence? Do the townsfolk think that the clouds and thunder above High Hrothgar is one of Shilgorath's thunderstorms? And what did Willandria want with magically manipulating the clouds when she asked for the cloud emulsifier? And why does Wilhelm have so many damn buckets? And why is Fellstar Farm called Fellstar Farm? What in the name of Lorcan is a Fellstar? Is the Fellstar the Mad Star, Shilgorath? I don't know. Is Nafi being the son of Loki, a god associated with madness and chaos, merely a coincidence, given we have the chaotic mad god Shilgorath and the mad man Nafi here in Skyrim? That sure is a rather odd coincidence, right? Was Nafi sent mad by a Shilgorath telling him something that he shouldn't know? And why in oblivion is Shilgorath referred to as the Sithis shaped hole? What's a Sithis shaped hole? And where do I get one? Isn't it obvious? Oh, and the final most burning question of all. Why the hell is there a piece of cheese on the ground at Feldstar Farm? Such a thing could drive one a little bit mad. But such mental risks are all in a day's work when it comes to investigating the Elder Scrolls series and its many strange stories. So I do hope that you have learnt something new about the beautifully mad universe that these wonderful games take place in, the Elder Scrolls. If you have any information, facts, evidence, speculation, theories, or anything to do with Raider, Nafi, or any of the above threads of thought involving this dizzying rabbit hole, I would love to hear what you have to say. If you have any ideas for something that should be covered in the Elder Scrolls Detective series, be sure to let me know, I will look into whatever strange and obscure topics that you present. If you enjoyed this video, please do me a kindness and leave a like, which helps other people know you enjoyed it. Leave a comment with your Elder Scrolls detective video ideas and your thoughts on the seemingly unsolvable mystery of Raider and Nafi. And of course, if you did enjoy this video and you would like to see more videos similar to this one, please subscribe. It helps me know that people enjoy this kind of content and it will result in more of it in the long run. Be sure to click that little bell icon next to the subscribe button right here on YouTube so that you will be notified when a new Elder Scrolls detective video is uploaded. 
My other Elder Scrolls Detective videos can be found down in the description via the Elder Scrolls Detective playlist link. Down there are also all of my social media links. Be sure to check all of that out to keep up to date with what I'm up to, especially when I'm making one video for four months and just totally missing in action. In times like that, yes, it's definitely handy to follow me on social media to know I'm not dead and am making another video. And of course, be sure to check out the merch store. There is a ton of cool Elder Scrolls related stuff on there, most of which I painstakingly designed myself. And if you did enjoy this video and you would like to help support the channel in a more personal way, go ahead and grab some of that merch, become a patron on Patreon, become a member with a join button right here on YouTube, or you can drop a super thanks with the super thanks button right below the video right here on YouTube. As I'm sure you know, all of my time and energy goes into making these videos that I create for you to enjoy. So your support is most genuinely appreciated and welcomed in any and all forms. So thank you very much for watching. Thank you for supporting the channel. I've been Camel, and I will see you very shortly in the next video. I will see you there soon.